Okay, members, uh, you're very welcome to today's meeting of the Education Committee. Can yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to try dialing off and back on again, Morris? Sorry. Sorry, Morris. Okay. In the meantime, members, can I check who is on the teleconference in terms of committee members? Karen, thanks, Karen. Okay, Catherine, yep. Robbie, Robbie. Robbie thanks, Robbie. Anyone else? Daniel McCarthy. Thanks, Daniel. Robin will be made, so. I'm okay. Boris. Any other members on the teleconference? No? Okay, then, we'll make a start, members. Can I. Uh, Confirm with members uh, that you can all hear proceedings okay? Yes. Yes. Yep, okay. Yes. And can I suggest to members that all devices be set to mute if possible, except when you're speaking? And if the sound quality is poor, um, you could try to dial off and back on again, and perhaps endeavouring to use a, a landline where possible. I can also advise members that I will, as previously, ask each of you in turn uh, to ask questions. We have a lot to get through today, so um, I really need us to, to stick to focused, concise questions and, and avoid too much commentary and preamble. Um, can I remind members that although the public gallery is closed, proceedings uh, are broadcast and um, as usual when we are in public session. Uh, can I also ask the clerk to speak? Uh, Chair, as uh, we're up against it as regards time, I think I'll set a good example for members and not say anything, and uh, we'll maybe return to those matters later. Agreed. Agenda item one then, members. Any apologies? No. <coughs> no apologies? Okay. In terms of brief chairperson's business, members, can I ask that the committee again record our ongoing gratitude to frontline workers in education and childcare for the ongoing commitment to children and young people and families um, during lockdown? Agreed? Thank you. Can I advise members, uh, according to press reports, that the Republic of Ireland is set to adopt a uh, similar approach as the UK in respect of formal school examinations, and it is understood that the leaving certificate similar to GCSEs and A-levels will be decided by assessment rather than formal written examination. I can also advise members that, according to press reports, the dates for post-primary transfer tests have been delayed to two weeks later in November and December. And remind members that we um, are grateful for the opportunity to discuss uh, post-primary transfer with AQE and PPTC at our meeting shortly. Okay, agenda item three then, members, is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the meeting of the 6th of May 2020 at page six and seek members agreements to the draft minutes and that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, I have no matters arising. Any other members have matters arising? No. Okay, then, members, that allows us to move to agenda item five, uh, which is the coronavirus and post-primary transfer uh, oral briefing from AQE and PPTC. That's the Association of Quality Education and the Post-Primary Transfer Consortium. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Education Committee clerk at page 13, a briefing paper from AQE at page 20, an Assembly Research Overview on Academic Selection at page 21, the EA Guide on Post-Primary Admissions for 2020-21 at page 27, and a briefing paper from PPTC in Tabled Papers as well as correspondence from the Children's Commissioner, also in table papers, um, so setting out for what it's worth profound objection uh, to the current approach on post-primary transfer, I think uh, the Commissioner would wish me to add. Okay, can I confirm that the following uh, have been able to dial in? Carol McCann, Chairperson of the Post-Primary Transfer Consortium. Yes. Thank you, Carol. Bob Cummings of the Post-Primary Transfer Consortium. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Bob. 
Darren Barr, Joint CEO of the Association for Quality Education. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. And Ian Node, Chairperson of the Association for Quality Education. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just a moment, members. By way of uh, welcome, then, can I uh, say we're very grateful for the opportunity to engage with you in constructive discussion about the important matter of post-primary transfer and invite you to make brief opening remarks, and then I will permit members to ask uh, questions uh, to you on, on these matters. You're very welcome. Thank you. Who wants to start? Shall I make a broad start, uh, uh, Chairman? Feel, um, feel, uh, sorry to cut across you. Feel free to reintroduce yourself when you're speaking, just for purposes of clarity. Thank you. Yes, yes I, I'm Chairman of AQE. Um, uh, we're very glad to be here to be able to uh, have a discussion with you uh, and with our colleagues from PPTC. Um, I, I would si simply say that if you want to talk about the COVID-19 scenario first, and ask us questions on that uh, uh, and how things are going on that front with, regarding the transfer test. And then presumably it might widen into a, a, a wide bit. But uh, I really we're here to listen to you and to answer your questions uh, in uh, as best we possibly can. Oh, okay. okay. Anyone else like to make any other opening remarks? Uh, Carl McCann, uh, Chair of EPCC, and again, we welcome the opportunity to discuss this with you, and obviously, I'm interested in, in your views, and um, whatever questions you may wish to ask, we would hopefully be able to respond to them as best we can. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I, I have a, a number of questions. Obviously, post-primary transfer is a, a significant matter uh, in, in Northern Ireland, and um, this, our engagement with you is um, scheduled to some extent prior to COVID-19, so I, I would um, be grateful for the opportunity to engage in the wider issue as well as um, how that pertains to the urgency um, of COVID-19 situation. So um, I suppose the key question that I have asked um, to date is the, the rationale um, as to why um, the bodies involved in the administration of the test believe that it is a fair and a necessary uh, approach to use two tests um, of up to five one-off non-reset tests to transfer our children from year seven to a common curriculum for all children in year eight, year nine, and year ten. Are you asking uh, why there are two tests, basically, uh, Jim? No, I'm, I'm asking why there are tests why, at all. Why, why you believe that this is a, a fair and a necessary way to transfer children from year seven to the common curriculum in year eight, year nine, and year ten? Well, if we go back to uh, 2008, uh, when the, the original 11 plus test was uh, abolished, uh, nothing was put in place to replace it, and there was a massive public demand that uh, testing was something that was desirable and desired, uh, and that was borne out by all the surveys that were done at the time. So both companies, AQE and PPTC, simply stepped in to fill a gap that was being asked for by the public, by teaching staff, by schools, and really... The, the issue is both of us have a system of testing which schools, in their wisdom, individually decided and have decided and still are deciding to use as their means, their, their fairest means that they can come up with, of uh, addressing the problem of oversubscription. And if you look at these schools, they are academic schools, uh, so you would say, well, why shouldn't they, why wouldn't they use some form of academic selection to sort out that problem for them. There are other ways of uh, transferring pupils from primary to secondary, but none of them have proven to be uh, particularly fair or practical. Okay, that was AQE. Did PPTC want to respond yes. to that question? Yeah, well, I 
Well, I suppose I just want to concur with AQE that there was a vacuum in 2008, and I suppose two organisations were set up in which um, who aimed to try to um, manage um, the vacuum that was in place at the time. Um, I suppose how children are entered to any school, um, the criteria for entry rests with the, the Board of Governors. Um, and I suppose each individual school makes their own decision um, in and around that. Um, PPTC would represent a selection of schools, some which are fully um, academically selective, some which are partially academically selective. But criteria for entry um, is always the provenance of the boards of governors. So ultimately, the decision around that um, lies with the boards of governors and um, with individual schools. Um, and that has been, I suppose, the way that the schools that have been, I suppose, grammar schools for many, many years, um, that is how they've continued. And I suppose, again, going by the numbers that um, apply for the test every year, um, which seem to rise and have been rising in recent years, um, it seems to indicate that the public um, have got a great interest in it and it does facilitate um, upward mobility um, for many, many children. Um, and you know, many of our, our grammar schools with a very high fee school meal entitlement and it does facilitate those children getting an education that by a postcode lottery they would not be um, entitled to or have access to. So I don't know whether any of my colleagues want to come in on that as well. Perhaps, um, Bob, Bob here, I just wanted to say, and it's in our the PPC briefing paper, that neither PPTC nor ACE have any role at all in determining whether schools should include academic selection in their admissions criteria. So any decisions about whether or not there should be academic selection don't rest with the authority um, over those. And certainly within, it, 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 again, in our paper, over the years, a number of schools have chosen either to phase out academic selection to reduce the performance or to um, cease to have academic selection. But that is not anything that is within the remit of the company, PPTC. Okay. Um, that's, a, that's a common response that I'm receiving in relation to my question with regards to why it's necessary to take this approach. Um, it seems frequently people um, state widespread support for this approach and then declare their non-interest in the decision to use the approach. Um, but setting that aside uh, and, and engage constructively with some of the responses that you've given here, you've, you've said between both uh, bodies that there's a massive desire for testing and that surveys bear that out. Um, you've also said that the number of, of uh, children participating in the surveys is evidence of, a, of support for testing. Uh, I, would, I would argue, and it's put to me by many people, that participation in the test should not be conflated with support for the tests. And if a child has a desire to attend a school that requires them to participate in the test, then they have no choice other than to participate in the test, whether they like it or not. So I, I, I think it's significantly erroneous to equate participation in the test with support for the test. Can you, I think it was Ian, Ian, can you reference to which surveys you refer that demonstrate massive desire for testing? Uh, well, it, it went back to 2008 when uh, there were public surveys undertaken which demonstrated that very clearly. Um, I don't, I, there obviously haven't been public surveys since, but we go by the numbers that are applied to us. We don't have to apply if they don't want to, and uh, they have gone up by 23% over the past 10 years. So we do get a very strong view that um, people do want to put their children or parents in, in through the system in order to get into the school of their choice, if possible. Mm. Because, because they have to. You, you, also, you also stated that um, it's logical that an academic school would, would use academic selection for admission. Um, what, what is a, an academic school? How does it differ from others? Well, they don't have to. 
uh, it is just the way they've decided uh, that individually, as has already been said, individual boards think that that method is the, shall we say, the least unfair, in fact, and the most reliable for being able to address the problem of oversubscription, which every uh, school has. Okay. Primary schools have oversubscription as well? Indeed. And they don't use uh, academic selection? Well, sure oversubscription. Mm. But they, they don't resort to academic criteria for admissions? Not over here. I think you find they might do across the water. Mm. Okay. You, you also, I think, um, I think it was Carl potentially referred to the benefits of upward mobility via academic selection. Um, obviously difficult to identify a, a particular category um, to evidence that, but research suggests that as little as 20% of children entitled to free school meals attend uh, academically selective school compared to 80% non-selective schools. So on, on, again, on what data is the assertion that academic selection facilitates social mobility based? Yeah, I'm again. I think Ian has um, mentioned schools across the water and um, whereby people will do anything to get into an area because their child will be able to access um, a school, but they need to have a certain amount of uh, those um, certain income to be able to live in that area and have choices in and around that, where I suppose children can apply um, and apply to do the test irrespective of where they live in Northern Ireland. So um, I think that would evidence it. Um, I suppose one of the things that um, certainly there are many schools with um, free school meal entitlement well above the 20%. Um, there are also um, all ability schools with. Um, free school meal entitlement, which is significantly less than 20% as well. Um, so again, there's a range out there. But I think even if we look at our universities, our local universities are among the most socially inclusive universities, I think, in the UK. Um, and that would evidence that suppose, education across the board um, is actually working very well in Northern Ireland. Okay. Uh, other methods of assessment are used at, at primary school, PI, PIM, CAT. Why, why could um, those types of assessments not be used as opposed to the, the current tests? Um, this, is, this is Darren from AQE. Um, in terms of GCSE and A-level, it was a, a no-brainer for the, uh, the secondary and grammar schools to, to uh, use the data that they already have, because post-primary schools are very data-rich. They're focused on GCSEs and A-levels. And it was a, a fairly easy uh, match to, to predict grades and use rank order. Primary schools are not geared up to um, academic select pupils for, for school. And the type of data they have, the baseline data, the English and math scores, um, at, at this stage, they have not planned for it. So it would be highly unfair at this stage to ask primary schools for this particular year to look at that, but going forward, uh, in general terms, I don't think there'll be any appetite in the primary schools, in the staff, and with the leadership to do that. Um, it was tried way back, as you know, 40 years ago, and it lasted a year or two. There was very little success, so I don't think anybody would have any desire to go back to that. Well, it doesn't really answer the why. Why, why particular? Why? Why are those assessments conducted then? What's the purpose of them? Why can't they be used for ongoing progression? So those are baseline assessments for the children just to, to look at their attainment and their progression throughout the year. But they're not designed to, um, for academic selecting children into grammar schools. And um, uh, I doubt the unions would, would, uh, would agree to it as well. What, what is required for academic selection then? I mean, if a baseline attainment is not a good indication of a pupil's progression, what, what is the difference between that and the, the common entrance exam and the GL tests? Well, what do we do at uh, AQE and I think GL and um, PPTC do the same? We look at their English and Maths curriculum in T-Stage 3 and we test them on their literacy and numeracy at T-Stage 3 
um, on their attainment. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be actually, but... Um, please, please, yeah. please, sorry, I apologise, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, I think I come back to what Darren has already suggested. I think there would be huge um, antipathy among the primary schools to be involved in that. Um, you know, for many years, in fact, there was no um, no um, evidence even being provided for DE um, in relation to how children could perform at, at um, levels at key stage two. So um, I don't think there's any huge appetite on the primary schools to be the ones providing that data. Um, some schools will provide it um, if there's special circumstances or whatever when there's adjudication and around that. But mainly, um, I'm not sure that they would want to be involved in that. That's a, big, a bigger and a wider question, I think. I don't know whether any again my colleagues want to come in on that. Darren, again, from, from AQE, um, I think there will be trouble for a lot of um, secondary schools in August when these results come out because the pressure placed on principals and teachers when their predictions are used for A-levels and GCSEs will, will cause a lot of anxiety. Um, and I think to put that anxiety onto primary schools would be unsustainable. Oh, okay. I'm speaking in general here as well, obviously not just in, in, in COVID-related circumstances, but you know why, why those assessments are, are different to CEA and GL and, and why they couldn't be used. Why, and the next question then is, why, why in principle um, is it not possible to stream uh, pupils within a class rather than by a school? Can I go back to... Um really just to the, the previous question, a little bit. Um, if any of the schools which currently academically select choose to use primary school scores, they're perfectly free to do so. Um, within PPTC, if you like, the only the freedom that PPTC has is to set the conduct and mark or produce the setting, conducting and mark of, of assessments. Um, but it comes back to each individual school as to whether that is the route that they wish to go down in order to decide if their school is over oversubscribed, how they will select. And I mean, and, and I would encourage all oversubscribed schools, as, as they do, to consider every year what is the best way of trying to address the issue of, of oversubscription. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting a sense to a certain extent you're telling me I need to be asking these questions of schools? Yeah, yes, because the role of PPTC is not to determine whether, how schools select whether they should use um, an external assessment. That, you know, that, that's the role of, that is only the role of schools. The role of PPTC is to provide an assessment, but each school is free to determine, and it's a matter for individual schools, whether they feel that is the most appropriate route. Okay. And I mean, you, you referred earlier, sorry, to, to academic schools. There are plenty of schools well, that, which no, are academic, no, you, which you, you, do I not refer, to do. I referred to your reference to academic schools. I, I, I didn't use that term. But um, could, could you advise if, which, if there's a representative body of these schools that we could be asking these questions of them? Find the individual boards of governors um, to make uh, decisions in and around the, what the, the key aspects of what their school is. So again, the criteria every year comes to the board of governors to choose what that criteria is. Um, and essentially that, that, that is the remit of each board of governors of each school. So you, no body can represent every school um, because um, within various bodies, there are different types of school. Okay. Okay. Well, no schools do, however, enrol you in uh, administration of this process. So, can I can I ask AQE why uh, the types of tests you use and, and why three sets of tests? Obviously, that's particularly relevant uh, to 2020, given um, the pressure that is on children and young people at this time. Yes, uh, it's why three tests? Um, obviously, AQE originally looked at different models of testing and were very concerned that, um, and very aware 
that the wide range of abilities of pupils at primary level needs to be considered. And we believe that at the current model of three tests, when two best scores count and one uh, is discarded, the worst one, gives every pupil a chance to have a sort of trial run at the test. It also gives pupils who may not have had great uh, assistance or the possibility of coaching, which does happen, uh, a chance to have a, a run at a test and familiarize themselves uh, with the layout of it because the AQE test in each time measures the same domains of area in math and English based on the revised curriculum. So it really gives, uh, we think, pupils the fairest chance to have a go at the testing, knowing that they can have an off day for whatever reason, and it will not count against them. Okay, and PPTC, why, why do you use uh, uh, a different type of test and why one test? Well, I suppose originally we decided to use the GL testing because, again, um, there would be quite a bit of, all of the schools in Northern Ireland will use GL testing at some stage or other. Post-primary, it's used, it's used in primary school um, as well. So um, we decided to use an outside provider um, who could mark the test and um, who could then um, help us with the whole administration of the test, the setting of the test and the, uh, the marking of the test. So it's just two different models of testing, but they probably have quite a lot in common. Um, and obviously, um, there has been quite a lot of work and some on work ongoing uh, in relation to probably getting to a, an agreed position where everybody, and that's something which has been long rehearsed, um, but as an implementation team looking after getting to one uh, common test uh, going forward, and hopefully that will happen. Why do we not have? Well, maybe I, I can broaden that slightly. Why is there? Why do we not have one test for all children? Well, I think um, it's particular. Sorry, Bob. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, Chair. Um, it goes back historically. It was a little bit at the start of our um, discussion paper about that, and it does go back historically to the fact that um, at the at the time that. Um, the 11 plus was ended, uh, the schools which had been academically selected took slightly different views as to a way forward at that time. Nobody had realised at that time or thought at that time how long might that um, go on. I suppose over the years both, both systems have found that um, it has worked for them um, and it has, because of that, it has taken some time to get to a position where, if you like, there, there's enough common ground. There's, there's always been a recognition, I feel, that having one test, one testing system would have an advantage. But I think the key point is that we are now at the point where there's active work going on to see if that can be um, achieved. Do you, do you not think parents are profoundly frustrated that that hasn't been achieved and even more so now that they face the prospect of four to five tests in the midst of a public health emergency? Sorry, uh, I do think that parents would like to see um, a single testing system if that's possible and that is what um, we are working towards. The, the COVID-19 situation doesn't help in getting to that point more quickly. And so there won't be one test for 2020-21 then? Well, for 2020-21, both testing organisations have announced their own uh, separate plans. So there will be two. AQE will be providing assessments for 2020-21, and, and PPTC will also be providing assessments for 2020-21, so no, there won't be a single test for the current P6 children. Okay, um, you mentioned research earlier. Obviously, there's a significant amount of research in relation to post-primary transfer. What, what would your response um, to research, such as the 
First Minister and Deputy First Minister Commission Queen's University report entitled Investigating Links in Achievement and Deprivation, which found that in addition to economic factors, legacy of conflict and insufficient SEND support, that academic selection is one of the most significant policy and structural inhibitors of attainment in disadvantaged communities, and that academic selection advantages those with means to pay for private tuition? Well, as, as, as I said, uh, that is certainly a view that is expressed, uh, and that is why uh, we, we went down the three-test model. But we also see um, the, the opportunities that it provides for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, and it offers all children a chance, we believe, to fulfill their potential where, where absolutely possible. And there's lots of research, as you mentioned there, uh, that, that, that might say otherwise. But we believe that, again, I have to get back to the system of what is the fairest system. If you look at the alternatives that Carol has already mentioned, postcode lottery, where really it becomes who can afford to live in the right area beside the right school they think is, is the best one. And that is absolutely right in England and is blatantly, we think, less satisfactory than the methods we use at the moment. There was also an issue of, we talked about sort of assessment at primary level. You, you will recall perhaps that in 1978, there was no test and uh, efforts were made to, for primary schools to provide the information to justify where children went, and it did not go well. Uh, it, primary principals and teachers found that very difficult, extremely stressful. Uh, they were open to all sorts of pressures. And very quickly, the old 11 plus was put back in place. Mm. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I answer that? This is Karen again, uh, yeah. about the deprivation. Yeah. First time I met Carl, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, was at uh, Nimerick University. We were there um, supporting two of our students. I was a principal at the time, and it was for the JP McManus Scholarship, which is the All Ireland Scholarship for uh, children from uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. And both our schools, both our schools, um, were winning that award regularly because we were enabling those children from very deprived and difficult backgrounds to achieve the top results in. A particular county in Ireland they lived in. In my case, it was County Down. I think in Carl's case, it would be County Antrim. Um, and uh, the experience I have is my own, my, myself, I was the first person in my family to go to university, my wider family. And my brother was the same uh, because we, I have to say, managed to scrape through the old 11 plus. Got to a grammar school and I've done fairly well for myself. But that is, of course, anecdotal. And no system of selection is perfect. Everyone, everyone has inherent weaknesses and strengths, but we think in balance, this one is a fair one and a good one. Okay. Um, in terms of the 2020-21 um, transfer and in the context of coronavirus school closure, can, can I ask you how it's fair to require our 10-year-old our children to sit tests in November and December of this year? further to several months of remote learning and three further stages of blended school and remote learning when families will have completely different capacities to learn due to inequitable access to materials, internet, computer resources, tutoring and work commitments. For example, both parents could be key workers serving the community and, and cannot work from home. Yes, if I may uh, just uh, answer that one, Chair. Um, that was a view with which AQE had a great deal of sympathy, uh, and it is why we therefore wrote to the Minister by proposing that the test should be postponed until January to allow more direct teaching time once children got back to school, uh, on the assumption they were going back in September, and of course that is completely unknown still. And Darren and I engaged with uh, DE officials on three occasions, and including once with the Minister, and we looked at various options uh, to try and see if uh, our delay could be accommodated into the official transfer process. 
and uh, we recognize that the Minister's firm support for academic selection, and we examined a good number of options in good faith, but I'm afraid, eventually, for logistical reasons, it was reluctantly recognized that uh, our offer or proposal could not be accommodated into the EADE transfer process, which required, obviously, a certain amount of time, uh, and it could not be foreshortened to accommodate our proposed delay. So, regretfully, therefore, we had no option but to go back to uh, uh, something near our original dates. They're not quite the same, as you mentioned earlier. They're two to three weeks uh, later than originally envisaged. But uh, that is the reality of the position. Mm. Um, can I just come in there as well? I suppose across schools in Northern Ireland, across all levels, I think it is a, it's, it's, it's a, a problem for all children, irrespective of the age and stage that they're at, that unfortunately we're having to educate them remotely. But I have to say um, that teachers are working valiantly and extremely hard to try to teach children the best they can remotely and find new ways of approaching. Um, that, whether it is with regard to um, delivering tasks and getting work marked online or otherwise. Um, and, you know, we're, we're sitting at all levels of education with regard to that, where, say, for example, this year, children maybe in year 11 didn't have access to exams um, and don't have grades for that. And then going forward, you know, their education has been impacted. So, again, I think it is something which um, is impacting across all levels and not just with regard to post-primary transfer. Um, as well as that, um, we all use standardised age scores and um, ultimately um, the performance will be dictated by the cohort. Um, so, again, uh, you know, even if it is um, somewhat lower by way of performance, there will be a levelling out. Um, in terms of the, uh, the outcomes, and the outcomes will end up pretty much the same. Um, and then again, I think it's when at all post-primaries, whether you're um, an academically selective school or a non-academically selective school, all schools will have some job um, to kind of get children caught up. It just doesn't really matter what, what level they are or what type of school they are. But yes, we are very, very mindful of that, and we will be doing all within our power to try to mitigate against this particular situation, as I'm sure um, all schools are currently um, trying to ensure the children at all levels, whether the, the, the children at, um, you know, the ones that are more academically able and the ones that are differentiated learning across um, the primary and post-primary. Um, so as I say, there's a huge amount of work going in in all schools across all levels and um, teachers trying to educate children the best they can. And we certainly, as educators, would love that our children were able to be back at school. Okay. Um, so and hopefully DE will be looking to prioritise key years in post-primary and in primary because it's something which troubles all of us greatly. Okay. So again, Sorry, I Chair, can, I, can I just supplement a point that was made there in the middle before I lose it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, it's just, in relation, it's just in relation to uh, some of the comments that have been made that uh, all schools, all children will have the same task in trying to catch up when uh, schools actually do return. But you're missing a clear point here. Uh, there are many from socially deprived backgrounds whose uh, parents cannot afford to, pay, afford to pay for extra tuition outside of school, which undoubtedly is happening as it is. That gives wealthier families, wealthier children, an unfair advantage over those from socially deprived backgrounds who would not be able to afford such tuition. So, so I don't, I don't, uh, I don't believe uh, that this is an accurate reflection of reality here. And to be very honest, what I'm hearing is very concerning, and, that, and that's the truth. I'm listening to this, and I'm, I'm pulling my hair nearly w w uh, with frustration listening to this. That this is not relevant to what's happening on the ground. It's certainly not relevant to the many children and families who are worried uh, about their children uh, whenever schools return. Uh, because there will be, uh, as I've said, wealthier families that will be able to uh, pay for tuition for their children, uh, and that will put them at a very clear advantage to those from socially deprived backgrounds who couldn't afford such opportunities. Yeah, to supplement that, Daniel, and then to seek a response, um, you, 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 in your response, um, uh, attendees, witnesses say that um, all levels are affected. They are to the extent that GCSE and A level examinations have been cancelled. Um, you say that the cohort and the outcomes will somehow level 
the playing field. As, as Daniel alludes to there, we already have differential access to private tuition, but as, as I add as well, um, we have completely variable home learning environments at the moment as well in terms of parental capacity or parental availability. So how, how is that in any way a level playing field for the tests in November and December? Uh, 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 we, we, we took a lot and have a lot of sympathy with exactly what you're saying. Uh, and those are the very points we raised with DE officials and ministers in the past three weeks. Uh, and we had long discussions about this for all those points that you have made. And unfortunately, they were unable to accommodate us putting back the test, say, for seven or eight weeks that could not be accommodated within the transfer process after Christmas. Mm. And, um, okay, final question for me before I bring uh, members back in. Um, what, what other options are, were considered or are being considered? In terms of what? In, in terms of the completely unfair um, approach that's being taken at the moment, given the variable access to learning to set a set of tests in November and December? Do you, do you mean in terms of transfer for yes, the yes, for, yes. Um, Well, I would dispute that it's completely unfair, but uh, it's up to the individual grammar schools, uh, schools who academic select, to ensure that they have a contingency built into the criteria, and in case the tests don't go ahead. Um, but, but we can't comment on individual boards of governors and what they might do at this stage. So you don't, you're not aware of the detail of any contingency plans. We would have no input into that. It's individual, as Carl said originally, it's individual boards of governors taking account of the DE circular and the guidance issued by DE, which they have to do by law. Okay, okay, thank you. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we've covered quite a bit of it. Carl, Ian, Darren, and Bob, thank you so much for, for coming this morning and giving us your time. Um, and I know a lot of this is supposed to be directed, I suppose, at grammar schools and um, or schools themselves. Um, but I suppose this is the first time I have had an opportunity to engage with these, that engage with um, others in the sector in relation to this issue. I suppose on the situation we're currently in, I have been contacted, like all our members, um, by worried parents, but in particular key workers, who feel that their children will be at more of a disadvantage as they are unable to spend the time teaching and coaching them. Um, uh, so they're asking what support will be there for them. Rather than delaying the test by two weeks, we'll have an opportunity here to do away with this test that drives educational inequality. Children will be out of school for nearly six months. If they return in September, and the department was already speaking about staggered learning, and the chair covered um, uh, it, it there uh, around um, the unfairness of coming back in such a short time frame and sitting a test. And we need to be focusing on a plan that supports them educationally in terms of their mental health and well-being. And a publicly funded education system should be providing the same opportunities to all our children. And like the other member that came in there, um, I am more uh, uh, both dismayed this morning and listening to some of the commentary here. In my city, all of our one grammar school take children with a day. So that being said, all you have to do is sit the test, not pass it. So why test? Who, who's benefiting from it? <coughs> not sure if anybody wants to answer this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Phoebe have answered quite a bit about that already. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's nice to speak to you, Karen. Um, because again, it is down to suppose individual schools what to do. If I can yeah. just come in on the tuition, um, I suppose again, um, we're all aware that irrespective of what level, whether it's GCSE, A level, and um, you know, primary education, that there can be a level of tuition. I suppose at the moment um, there won't be any tuition happening because of all of the socially distancing um, rules in place. I would be very surprised if there was much tuition going on at the moment, um, if everybody was following the rules and the regulation. Um, again, I suppose irrespective of... Tuition can happen over Zoom as well. I'm sorry for interrupting, but you know, 
we can't double standard here. We're, we're asking people to learn online. Education can happen over Zoom or over those electronic devices. So I don't think it's right to dismiss that that is happening. I, I know for a fact it's happening. Well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for what's happening over Zoom. I know that certainly um, we've, we've had many discussions in school about why we can't use Zoom, and there are certain issues around why we don't use Zoom, um, um, just with regard to C2K advice. So um, I can't speak on respect of that. I don't know whether anybody else wants to come in on that. It, it, it goes back again. It's up again. It goes back again to the role of the individual school. Oversubscribe at the current situation is devising a provision here for next year. Sorry, is that, is that Ian or Don? Yeah, no, yeah. Ian, you were, Ian, you were breaking oh. up a bit there. Do you want to try yeah. again? Yeah. Uh, bring Karen yeah. up for supplementary. Yeah. Yeah, and just on the oversubscription that you talk about, oversubscription can be resolved through area planning. That, how you, that is how it's managed for the other schools, working together so that some schools uh, is not at an unfair disadvantage, which is, is happening at the moment. And again, I speak about my own uh, city here. My daughter attends a non-selective school here. She doesn't have to sit a test to get on there. It's one of the best here in the city that we have, but the non-selectives are at a disadvantage because the grammars are able to fill their numbers and do fill their numbers, as I say, with D, so why test? It is really unfair, um, and I concur with the Chair's point on participation versus support. P parents are left with no choice um, to get their children and the school, so they have to put their children through these tests, and again, I speak as a parent. Um, on, on that who has been through that system with two children, one who's bad and one who didn't. And I can say the journey with the one who didn't was far better um, uh, than, than the one who did. Um, I want to commend all the schools that have moved away from academic selection, and I concur with the Children's Commissioner that schools must rethink this system urgently. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Can I bring in uh, Robin Newton? Robin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, can, can I, Chair, can I just say this meeting and the invitation to Bob, Carl, Darren, and Ian is because we are concerned around the situation of COVID-19. And yet what we're doing now is straying into the argument about selection or non-selection. I speak as someone who didn't attend a grammar school, but I'm supportive of grammar schools, and I'm supportive of the right of a parent to make their choice. And the parents have made their choice. They have come out strongly in favour of supporting grammar schools. So uh, the only arguments that are being made at the moment seem to be not about COVID D and COVID nineteen and the implications for that, but really around whether or not you support selection. Selection is settled, parents have made their choice, and the arguments really that we're coming forward at the moment are, are really arguments for another day, and arguments in the chamber. In terms of uh, the uh, selection as it happens this year, I have concerns obviously the way others have, and whether or not some children uh, may be disadvantaged uh, in uh, the transfer test. I know that uh, as best possible in this unprecedented situation, uh, relationships will be opened up and will be uh, tried to, to uh, address the issue. But uh, it, 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 there is, I think, a number of uh, matters that have been brought to my attention where particularly uh, children who have uh, specific circumstances, and I, I would want to follow those up, uh, and I would want to ensure that uh, those children who perhaps do not get through this year, that the routes into grammar school can be more definitely opened up in year two, one, year two, as, as, they, as they progress through second level edu education. But I, I want to say, Chair, I, I am supportive of the selection process and supportive of the grammar schools. 
and uh, the arguments, I think, on those, those have been settled. Maybe if I could raise just, and I, I'm not sure that this is a question for the, the panel with us today, but can I just ask, uh, I've had a couple of parents who contacted me, one whose child has uh, been held back because he, he actually was uh, uh, born premature and has not matured perhaps as well as, as had been felt. Parent would like to see if there was a could be a postponement. Can I ask you, is, is there any arrangement within the testing to give, even if at this stage, some weighting towards that? And can I ask a, a second question on whether or not there was, uh, uh, and it was raised, I think, by someone else, where perhaps uh, parents are involved in uh, very much the sharp end of dealing with uh, uh, COVID-19 where they perhaps have not been at home uh, and unable perhaps to, to encourage the children uh, as well as possible. Uh, and is there any uh, allowance given for those type of circumstances in the test? Okay. 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 Can I answer? just remind everyone, if, if at all possible, to mute your, your facility when you're not speaking. There's, there's still a fair amount of, of reverb there, but um, if you could do that and uh, the uh, witnesses wish to respond to Robin's question. Thanks. Okay, this is Darren from uh, AQA again. So in terms of um, any provision for people who may have difficulties or a child who's premature, um, the parents can always apply for special access arrangements directly to uh, AQA. It's slightly different with PPTC, but they have still a similar process um, where they can apply for extra time or additional help during the test, and also post, um, post results being issued. Parents can also apply to individual grammar schools for special consideration, and that would also apply to the likes of if two parents were key workers and they felt they weren't able to teach their children during lockdown, which I know is a real issue for a lot of people, they can apply to the individual grammar school for special consideration. The individual grammar school then use the criteria and um, uh, consider that. Yeah, and in that case where it is in fact a parent who isn't actually at home because of the, the work that they do uh, in this emergency, um, and, and that would be, they would have to apply to one grammar school then to have an assessment uh, done on the child or what would it work? The way it works at the moment, there's talk about changing, but the way it works at the moment, the special circumstances applications are attached to the transfer form. It will then go to the first preference school, and if that school doesn't take a child, it will go to the second preference school. So they only apply once. It's attached to the form, and all of the schools will consider it in turn. Okay. Okay. And I have to say, is that generally known? Is, is that you make that known as, as the... Uh, yes, it, it's on it's on the AQE website, and I'm sure it's on PPTC's website as well. And also, if you speak to any principal, either in the primary or, or secondary sector, they'll be able to advise them as well. Okay, can I, I just add, sorry there for uh, Bob, Bob again. Um, immediately after the assessment, there's, a, there's documentation called the Special Circumstances Pack, um, which is available to all parents and outlines how, if they feel that their child may have been disadvantaged in some way, how they can proceed with that. Ultimately, it will then come down to the, to the Board of Governors of the Grammar School or the, not the Selective School to determine um, the merits they see in a particular special circumstances and the, the evidence they have. Again, in, in advance of that, it's still open to each Board of Governors when they're determining their admissions criteria this year to see if there's any account that they can take of the COVID-19 situation. Yeah. Uh, can I just, Bob, um, in terms of that pack, is that pack automatically follow the test results then? No, um, a letter would be sent out with the test results, and, as, and part of that letter would direct parents that, that if they were um, unhappy or they felt that their child's performance in the assessment had been affected by particular circumstances. In fact, 
it goes out in a letter to screen after they've done their, their assessment. Then it guides them through the, the process. But that process is then carried out with the, um, the post with the post primary school that they apply to. And I suppose one of the key things about it is that when the uh, post primary schools are determining the merits of a particular case, they're looking for evidence. So simply to say, for example, that your parents were key workers or that this happened, there, there needs to be some evidence as to how the child has been um, disadvantaged. And then it's, it's a responsibility, again, of a subcommittee of the Board of Governors of that particular school to read everything that is provided for it and to weigh up whether they should then set aside the outcome which the child was given through their assessment and ascribe a, uh, you know, a new outcome having taken account of the special circumstances. And evidence would be the child's school records? Would... There'd, there'd be a number of things. That, yeah. that yeah. would certainly yeah. be one. Okay. And that is where the Boards of Governors have to take account of um, evidence from the primary school regarding um, outcomes, amongst other things. In terms, final question then, in terms of the one test, uh, and I understand that there will not be a one test for, for uh, this incoming year, what do you believe is, is the potential for a one test uh, in the following year? Uh, well, our understanding is the, the implementation group, which is made up of equal numbers from both um, organisations, are working as rapidly as they can to try and see how quickly um, they can bring about a single assessment. And then that will be brought to all of the, the, the member schools. It, it's very difficult uh, because they haven't yet, um, if you like, issued a statement as to how, 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 where their progress is at. So it's very difficult to predict when we might expect anything. Okay, that's me, Charles. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Robin. Uh, after that, it's Ian, Ian speaking. Um, I, I agree with what Bob has said there. We, we don't know what the proposals are for a single test, but when they are made manifest, it will go before each member school of PPTC and ATE, and it will be up to the member schools to decide whether they go forward on that model or not. But it does take up to two years to start a test from scratch, to test it, to make sure everything is right about it, uh, to provide uh, exemplary materials for it. So it, it, it looks, uh, it's certainly 21, 22 will still be, we envisage uh, the current system. Okay. Okay, so we could be three years down the line before a, a, a single assessment uh, may be agreed. If, 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 it, if it is acceptable to member schools, it would be certainly two years. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, very brief for me before I bring Daniel in um, to witnesses. Uh, is there any concern that you could see um, you could be inundated with special circumstances applications given the current circumstances? I think that's a very real possibility, uh, and uh, it, this will be something for schools to have to. Uh, in, in a sense, handle and work their way through because the current scenario is extraordinary and unique. So, yes, I think that's a possibility. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to our guests for the presentation so far, which I disagree with quite a lot of what has been said by them, but uh, that's the, the joys of this committee. Um, I'm sure that they will, they will, they will know very well uh, as will my colleagues around this committee table, that the stress levels of parents and pupils have gone through the roof since this announcement has been reached uh, in recent uh, days. So uh, I'm hearing quite a lot of concern uh, being shared with us, and a lot of the points have been covered in relation to uh, why those concerns are uh, valid uh, and, and uh, uh, as to how they're going to disproportionately affect various children. And I've made that point very clearly around um, uh, ch children from wealthier backgrounds uh, being able to access uh, extra tuition by whatever means necessary. I will not get into debates about whether they use Zoom or whatever other electronic 
online device uh, to do so. The reality is it is happening because there are parents worried about their children and are in a financial position in order to ensure that they can uh, properly access the opportunities that won't in any way uh, allow them to fall behind. But unfortunately, as a consequence of that, uh, as we well know, there's a lot of children that will be left behind because their parents cannot afford such uh, extra uh, tuition. Uh, just in relation to some of the points, and I want to mention testing, but uh, one that uh, around uh, the past, we're obviously in very uncertain times, on pieces in the times, times that are quite extraordinary and have affected every uh, facet of life, uh, and certainly in terms of schools and the education of our children, uh, they have been affected uh, quite severely. Uh, and we aren't going to see the exact impact of that until such times as these sorts of assessments are actually carried out. Uh, and you'll uh, uh, understand why I, I am quite, quite concerned in relation to it. I don't accept the arguments around, well, we can't have a single test. And I, I'm following on from some of the exploration of Robin's questions when I ask about a single test, because there is the GL test that does already exist. It's there, it's been used, it's been tested, it can be, it can be available very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, I think that that, given the extraordinary circumstances and the impact of COVID-19, uh, uh, that it is presented to our children and our schools uh, and parents, uh, that that should be considered as a way forward. Uh, and that would then enable an extra time frame uh, for uh, children to prepare better uh, for, these, for this particular exam. Uh, and then uh, we may be able to do away with uh, some of the uh, concerns and alleviate the pressures on children and parents. But also, uh, as the Chair has rightly said, uh, I would envisage a huge wave of uh, mitigating circumstance forms coming through the doors of schools and others. And let me say this bluntly, I'll be encouraging parents to do so, because I don't think that it is fair on pupils uh, to be uh, disproportionately uh, disadvantaged by something that is way beyond the control of any of us. Uh, and therefore, there, in my opinion, there isn't enough been done to ensure that they get the best possible uh, opportunity uh, 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 and attempt at these examinations. So that, 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 that's my skin fault. In terms of okay. the outbreak, Chair, I just want to make a very clear point. None of us know what's going to happen uh, over the next number of months. None of us even know if schools are going to return in September. So my, 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 my concern is that uh, if we unlock society all begin on a phased basis, uh, and there ends up being a, an increase in the level of infection and death, we could see a second outbreak of this by the autumn. That is going to present difficulties for schools that will have to close again uh, in the autumn term. How, how do you propose to, to carry out academic selection uh, in 2020 and 2021 if that's the case? There, there doesn't seem to be any realistic uh, understanding of this, not, not only of just the the difficulty and the circumstances we face as a society, but also the impact that this has had on children. When we as a assembly have been preparing for every other aspect of life in terms of business, the economy and others, and children are going to be thrown into the deep end, that's in effect, and I put this bluntly, you're cancelling Christmas for these children. And that's what my concern is, and rubbing salt in their wounds when parents are already very stressed. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Wait, witnesses wish to respond? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Ian again. Yes, we, we share all those concerns. If, for example, however, the coronavirus were to return in the autumn and prevent the uh, uh, sitting of any of these tests, then it will be back to the individual grammar schools to sort out or to have in place uh, their own criteria to face that very contingency. It would be far from desirable, I entirely agree, but that is the fallback position should the test not be able to take place. Mm. Okay, any, any other witnesses wish to respond? I need to keep this moving here. Yeah, no, just Bob, and just I would reiterate that, that it will be for, um, we've, already, we've stated previously that we recognise that the situation can change and it will be, will be a responsibility on every single um, academically selective school to bear in mind that they may have to make completely different um, arrangements or that the plans that they have could be altered. Um, but things are changing so rapidly, it's difficult to predict what the situation might be like in, in late autumn. Okay. Okay, Daniel?
Chair. That's not satisfactory whatsoever. To be very honest, and I'm saying this bluntly as a representative of many children in the constituency that has many children from deprived backgrounds, these answers are not acceptable. I don't believe there is any proper uh, thought going to, has gone into this process. And I'm sorry for the bluntness of my uh, uh, response to you. But in anything you have said today, there hasn't been due consideration given to the circumstances that are affecting children out there during this pandemic. Uh, and in my view, it is not appropriate for yourselves simply to throw out a test in December in the hope that the virus doesn't come back, and the hope that children will be prepared, and the hope that everyone will be able to go on and, uh, and be able to pass these assessments, and the hope that parents uh, don't submit mitigating circumstances for us, because these are absolutely mitigating circumstances that affect the child's ability to proceed with these assessments. And I, I, I am really frustrated, to be honest. And normally I'm quite polite, but I'm going to be blunt today. This isn't acceptable. Uh, there needs to be a proper thought process put in to the circumstances that are affecting these children today. And there needs to be action taken that will truly allow those children a fair opportunity, a fair opportunity to do these assessments and have a fair crack at it. Because this is a very stressful time for children. We already have established that. Regardless of which side of the debate we're on with transfer tests, it is stressful either way. It's a stressful time. And I don't think that you have, I don't think you are living in reality, to be very honest about it. And I'm sorry for the bluntness of that. But you need to come back to the table with something much more satisfactory for us. Okay, Dan. Yeah, I well, think, it's, uh, um, right, right. You want to come back? Yeah. I think, again, there is a huge amount of uncertainty at all levels in education. I mean, you know, I can certainly say, um, as principal, and I'm not here to speak as a principal this morning, but I can say that there's a huge um, amount of worry out there from children who are in fourth year, who are going to be proceeding into fifth year, and, you know, sixth year into seventh year, and there are so many imponderables. And we can only deal with what we, I suppose, know what certain relative certainties at the moment. And I suppose for all schools, I would hope that DE and planning forward will prioritise, you know, um, with regard to particular years. Um, we, nobody is saying that this is not stressful um, in any shape or form, and nobody is saying I mean, it's a totally unprecedented situation for all of us. And if we, if somebody mentioned the economy there. I mean, there's so much uncertainty around that. So it's just wide, wide across everywhere. And um, again, it, there has been a fair amount of thought. Um, and again, as everyone has said here, there will have to be a contingency criteria for each Board of Governors. We do expect to hear um, and to receive quite a lot of special circumstances. Um, schools are, are well used to dealing with those because every year we might get a high percentage of those anyway, which are dealt with by Boards of Governors. So they're well versed in that system. And primary schools are also well versed in advising um, the children and parents in respect of how they might actually um, apply for those circumstances. Um, and I would expect that no school would be found wanting in trying to support people the best we can. Um, and I also have to say with regard to, we were invited in um, about COVID specifically, and it has gone to a wider remit, um, which is, you know, so um, anyway, again, I don't know again whether any of my colleagues here wish to come in and, and say something. Okay, well, let, let, let me respond to that direct. Let me respond to that directly because a, a number of people are raising it, okay? I, I've been inundated by parents concerned about why tests are being set during COVID-19. All of my questions centered on why this form of testing is deemed necessary or best, particularly during COVID-19. And I will stand 100% over that. Um, I'm keen to bring other members in as well. Can I bring Robbie Butler in, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Dan, Carl, Ian. Bob, you know, on the phone a while, I'd like to make you on a little bit longer, but I genuinely have to, first of all, say that I am extremely concerned um, as to what's going to happen uh, when the new... Ro Robbie, can I, can I just check everyone is hearing you clearly, because we're, we're not hearing you that clearly. It might be necessary for you to speak as loudly as cl and clearly as you can, due to the, the nature of the line that you're on there. Is that any better, sir? Slightly better, yep. All right, OK. I'll try and speak up, guys. I just want to, first of all, I uh, want to thank you for the time you've put in today to come in and, and speak to us. Um, just to point out that, again, you have a real concern for the, the P6 cohort at the moment moving into P7, as do all of the other members today. Um, we have seen um, a lot of agility and innovation from our teachers and the sector and even CCEA with regard to the other examinations. 
And I do believe, I'm not going to point to four fingers you guys, because I do believe that you reached out to the Department of Education and the Education Authority and made an offer of a postponement for six to seven weeks, if, if I'm correct in that. So most of the questions perhaps today will be uh, centred more towards the Minister. But I have a series of questions here to maybe um, try and establish if something else can be done, because I don't believe we've drawn a line in the sand, and I do believe there is scope to do the right thing by our P6 pupils and put them back to the centre of this conversation. So the, the first one would be a practical one. Do, do either of you have any practical reasons why the test could not be postponed longer than the two weeks that the Minister has stated at the moment? And I do believe at the start of this conversation, I think it might have been Dan had said the offer had been in around six to seven weeks. Um, yes, it's Bob. Bob, sorry, Bob, yes. Okay, no, uh, it was Darren who had said it, but if I could maybe, maybe come in. The, the key point, at, at the moment, uh, the, the situation has been that parents have to submit their transfer forms round about the end of the first week in, in February. That means that the outcomes from any uh, G, uh, GL or AQE assessments have to be with parents by the end of January. When AQE went to um, the minister, they were looking to see whether it was possible to have a significant delay in the, that date. So it's the date by which parents need to have outcomes that determines how late the assessments can be. And, and it wasn't possible to go beyond the December dates because at the moment, Parents would need to have outcomes by the end of January. Could I just say, uh, this is Darren again, we did have possibly split them over Christmas. But going back to Daniel's point, we did not want to split the, the test over Christmas. We felt that it would be better having them all done in a sequence of five weeks rather than to do maybe one or three before Christmas, squeeze two in after Christmas, and then we would even struggle to get the results out. We couldn't probably get the results out to the third or fourth week in February, which the DE may have been willing to move by two weeks, but it would have meant that the test would have been split over Christmas, which would have been unacceptable for everybody. Yeah, I, I do agree that the test would, it would have been unacceptable to split them over Christmas, but uh, looking at the agility and the innovation that has happened across the sector, it does look like, uh, and I may not see the full picture here, but it does look like there's a, there's a, a lack of agility or innovation somewhere in this conversation and in the, in the partnership. And looking at the other steps that can be taken, uh, you will have noted the, the five-stage plan that was reviewed by the executive with no specific dates and no specific dates with regard to return for pupils at the moment, so there are, are issues around that. And there will be issues around clustering, so uh, it has become a tradition that these tests are set in big centres with large clusters of pupils. Uh, I would be supportive of a move back to primary, and in terms of uh, establishing pupil safety, and given that comfort in removing that threat, would there be any, what, what is the, the position on uh, moving the test back to the primary setting as opposed to the big clusters, and given that we are talking about the COVID threat at the moment? Again, this is Darren again. That would be not on our gift, that would be on the gift of the Department of Education. Um, we would certainly engage in that conversation, but it would not be in our guest whatsoever. Yeah, I think that the Minister is going to be having quite a few questions. Um, and it's interesting, I noted, I noted, I think it was Daniel maybe, and Karen picked up about the traditional disparity in terms of higher children receive support and the social disadvantage being the most marked one. But this time, uh, in this instance, what it's going to be coupled with, and I think it was picked out, was we have key workers. Um, who either one or two parents are working long hours and they're, they're uh, young people uh, perhaps and they feel it are, are being disadvantaged at the moment. What work has been put in, uh, what work will be put in to ensure that any test, whenever they happen, um, will not reflect any part of a missed uh, curriculum? And what I mean is when, when the kids went, uh, went home on, on the 20th of March, that there is absolutely zero way of guaranteeing that anything that has been given, any education that has been given, either in home or by teachers, whether that's been using innovation online, um, can be fairly used in, in any test that is set. So there is a big gap there, and I think there's a real risk that some people, no matter how we do it, will, will miss out. 
Yes, I think that, that is a point. And we recognize that schools had reached different points of the curriculum uh, before uh, they were obliged to close down. Um, I don't think we should underestimate, however, the willingness of primary school teachers when schools do resume to make every effort to uh, get the curriculum covered. Uh, and they are making sterling efforts and huge efforts at the moment to, to the online teaching or the distant teaching facilities such as they exist. Um, there will be, without a doubt, a concentration to, to we say, finish off the curriculum when children return. It, it is one reason why we would be happy to see uh, preference given to the P7 to return early to school, if at all possible. But these are all issues that are going to be handled as best possible by all primary schools involved. Mm. Uh, uh, just one final question on that. Um, so discussions have obviously taken place between yourselves and the Department of Education and possibly EA. But in terms of a phased return for pupils, um, so November and December is, is in the distant future, but September isn't that far apart. I'm, I'm wondering where the capacity would be in any school to educate small numbers of P7 children on uh, the basis of either whether they're sick to test or whether they don't, um, because it will be a stage approach. I think that's, that's a given, and there will be massive capacity issues because classrooms will not be able to contain 25 to 30 pupils, perhaps 7 to 10 maximum. Um, and, and I think the teaching staff are already stretched, and I know you're right, the willingness is there. I'm not sure that we have the capacity to, to do this fairly. That's why I'm still maintaining that, that there, something more can be done with regards to the debate um, with the test guys. So um, I just don't have the comfort. Uh, it's not pointed at you guys. It's just I don't have the com comfort because I don't think the resource exists. Uh, and uh, the, I think the teachers have been under enough stress, to, to be fair. Yes. Hi, this is John again. I, I agree. Um, I suppose we have the luxury of seeing how England will will do, do with this before we launch it, but all schools are grappling with the same issue, not just for P7, but across the year groups, particularly for years 12, 13 and 14, as Carol will probably confirm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge issue, and I, I do feel sorry for all the children and all the schools, including my own daughter at the moment, but schools are very adaptable. They have a great teaching profession, and I'm every confidence that they will um, win through in this very challenging time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. okay thank, thanks for those questions, Robbie. Uh, wait, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. William Humphrey. Um, thanks, Chair, and thank you all very much for your presentation and your answering of questions this morning. Um, schools can be adoptable, adaptable. Uh, teachers can be as professional and committed as uh, they can be, and I pay tribute to those teachers as a governor in two schools this morning. But we are dealing with very unprecedented circumstances. And so therefore, I think we need to concentrate our minds that we're dealing with 10-year-old children here. 10-year-old uh, children who left school before the end of March. In some, and in fact, probably most circumstances, the curriculum wasn't completed. Uh, the, in terms of the, the practice tests, uh, they were only beginning in March. And some children may not have been able to sit any if many of them. So I think the, the, we need to keep it real here and concentrate on the challenges that are faced by the schools, parents, and in particular young people in terms of the COVID situation. Uh, I think, Ian, you mentioned earlier uh, that uh, this provides an opportunity for children from socially deprived areas. Well, I represent some of the most deprived wards, not just in Northern Ireland, but throughout the United Kingdom. And uh, I have to say I have received uh, correspondence and spoken to parents who are very concerned uh, about the fact that there is only a two-week extension. Now, I appreciate and I understand that you've answered the question in terms of made approaches to the department and to the EEA with a 78-week extension. But what I would have to say, I think you need to revisit that because two weeks isn't long enough. Clearly, they're telling you because of the, the knock-on effect that has in terms of the admissions into post-primary level, 78 is too long, so you need to go back and revisit that. We cannot have the situation where children lose months of school and probably um, potentially looking at it as we sit now, from being out of school from the end of March right through to the summer, 
uh, with, with, without that opportunity of being in school. And however committed parents are at home uh, to, to teaching, as others have said, some parents may well be key workers and not able to, to give the time that, 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 that other um, parents are able to do. Some school families may even have two parents that are key workers. I am also concerned, because I represent some of those communities, that um, outside influence and resource comes into this. In other words, if parents can afford to bring in uh, people to train, tutor uh, their children, then that is something which obviously is invaluable at this, this moment in time. Educational attainment, academic achievement, hugely important. We can't talk about hard to reach communities and the issues facing young Protestant males and so on and all of those issues uh, and not try and achieve a level playing field for all the children who would sit these tests to decide their, their academic future and what way their pathway will be in life. So I think there's just a lot of work that, that you guys need to go back and do. However much I may well <coughs> Uh, understand the predicament in which you're placed. I, I do think there are a lot of things that are, that are uh, out there causing real concern and anxiety to parents and particular particular children. So could you perhaps go back and revisit these issues? You've heard it from members across the political spectrum that have spoken here this morning. Um, but I think the onus is on you and the EEA to sort this out uh, because they're your tests, folks. I agree. We are. I, I agree that this the six week delay would be would, would be the way forward. But we are private companies and we have absolutely no input into public policy. And we approached the powers that be and the powers that be could not accommodate we thought a reasonable request. And I'm not sure what more we can do in terms of delay. Well it's yes, and, and I listened intently to what you said. You asked for seventy eight weeks, they couldn't accommodate that. If you're private companies, then show the agility of the private companies that are working in the private sector in this crisis and get a resolution for parents, for pupils and for teachers across Northern Ireland. Yes, well, unfortunately, we, 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 it's not within our gift, James Carroll, here um, to kind of influence the timetable which, um, within which DE and EA work. And um, that's something we, we have absolutely, it's not within our gift to manage that at all. Um, and I suppose, again, there was a request um, for an extension. Um, and I suppose, again, I want to sympathise as well with DE as well, because I do realise there has been a huge raft of, of issues uh, as a EA. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I know that this is one of, I suppose, many, many things that are hitting them at the moment. So I suppose, again, um, this is definitely on piece of entertainment. But again, there was no lack of willingness to put the test back for a while. Um, and we all have huge sympathy um, for, for all children at all ages, um, not just at transfer age, because, as I say, personally, I have a huge concern as well for the coming yeah, yeah, um, and Yes, Carl, but what I'm asking you to do uh, is find a middle ground by talking to the Education Authority and the Department between two weeks and the, and the eight weeks maximum that you were looking for. And I appreciate and I listened intently around the issue around Christmas. That would be far from ideal for any child to have to go through that ordeal um, coming up to Christmas. I accept that. But it's, you know, you're in front of us today. If the Education Authority was in front of us today, I'd be making the same point to them. You know, there has to, there has to be an accommodation. We are not in normal circumstances. You know, and so therefore people have to show that fl flexibility and agility to get around these issues. Uh, that's the only way we can get the outcome that you will want. Because if you don't do that, you will give great, great assistance and encouragement um, to those people who are totally opposed to your tests. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I can I just ask? Um, you, I think you originally actually said that you requested a seven to eight week delay. Um, not notwithstanding the fact that children look at them as twelve weeks of school followed by um, a hybrid model of school plus remote le learning. Um, I accept it's not within your gift to adjust the DEA timetable, which my understanding is normally ends on May the 30th, four weeks prior to the end of the school year. How, how long do you think DE and EA should be able to change their timetable by? 
Uh, Chairman, I could answer that. Yeah. Uh, okay. After our uh, three conversations with them, they made it very clear that they had no uh, ability to be able to change it back after the 30th of May because uh, that's not the end of this process of placing children in schools. There are further appeals come up, and if it was to go into June, it would mean some children would not be placed until July, August, or later, and that was something they were not prepared to contemplate. Mm. So is, is the, on, on that note, the only, the only option seems to be for them to find a way to expedite the, the time taken by the process normally. Um, is that is that a reasonable request in your opinion? We thought it might be doable. They better differ. Okay. Uh, thank you, William. Content? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would just I would just make the point, if I might return to the. Um, uh, I know we're focused today on, on COVID, but if I might ask just a quick question, uh, and Carol, if you don't have the figures in front of me, perhaps you might provide us with them. But I think in, in, in your presentation you, you mentioned that um, uh, the numbers of uh, taking part in the tests were, um, were continuing to rise. C can I ask, is that the num numbers in terms of children and schools? Maybe I can, the, the number of schools um, does not really change. In fact, if anything, the number of schools who are assessing uh, pupils using academic selection is, is drop, has dropped very, very slightly. Mm. But there are more, there are more, there have been more P7 children in the system and more children um, sitting in assessment. The, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that some children, particularly in, in Belfast, do both sets of assessments. Um, so the figures that each organisation holds contain some who are setting both sets of assessments. But the overall numbers are rising, even though the number of schools is not rising. Okay. And, and just finally, I'd just like to reiterate the point again um, in terms of uh, the tests and the preparation for those tests. Um, we absolutely need to keep at the forefront of our mind the fact that these 10-year-olds have been taken out of school at the end of March. Um, some of them were where there is the disposable income to allow it are getting um, you know, professional tutorage uh, at home uh, and the, the parents may really be <coughs> excuse me, in a position to do that. And we, we need to create as level a playing field as possible so that um, the opportunity that Ian talked about earlier in terms of um, children from socially deprived areas getting that opportunity is, is vitally important. I do not want to see a situation where um, young people from many of the communities that I represent are, are not giving, giving, given the opportunity to the same level and extent because uh, their parents don't have that income, because they may be single parent families, because they can't afford to buy in professional help. Because schools have been closed, homeschooling, lots of parents are trying their very best, but they are not teachers, they are not replacement for teachers. And, and however good uh, and adoptable teachers are in providing uh, the information, some children will not have the electronic devices either to assist in terms of that. And I am just concerned that all of this will drive up the, def uh, the deferential uh, and, and, and mean that more young people in, in working class, hard to reach communities will suffer negatively because of the situation. Situation that is beyond your control, I absolutely accept that. But it is really, really vitally important that, that your two organisations, as private companies, work with the EEA and with the department to get a resolution that will not be ideal, because it simply won't be ideal, because the time isn't there for it to be ideal, but as much as is possible is given to these young people to try and uh, catch up, I suppose, in terms of the time lost and the professional assistance that they, they, they will have lost through the, their, their teachers. Thanks, Chair. OK. Can I bring in uh, Justin? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Carol, Bob, and Darren, and Ian. Um, notwithstanding my party's opposition to academic selection, I do recognise that we're here to talk about the impact of COVID-19 and um, on the transfer test as is. Um, I would like to put on record that I fully empathise the duress that's been experienced by both parents and the young 10, 11-year-old kids 
who are facing such a period of uncertainty, not alone over 11 plus, but because their whole uh, lives have been turned upside down. And it's just important to recognise what those families are going through, and in particular those families of key workers who are under extraordinarily immense pressure away from this situation as well. Given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the duress being experienced by those 10-year-old uh, pupils to sit these tests, and the fact that nearly half the, the academic year has been lost, is a two-week postponement fair? Uh, uh, Justin, Ian speaking, I have to say uh, we would have preferred more. Uh, and that is what we took to the minister and his department. Uh, but I'm afraid also to have to say, at this stage we reach, it is the best we can offer. Mm. OK. Um, given that A-levels have been cancelled, GCSEs have been cancelled, leaving certs have been cancelled, junior certs have been cancelled, and they've all moved towards um, non-exam assessment, predicted grades, how is it acceptable for 10 and 11 year olds to be put through an extraordinarily stressful examination in the midst of this crisis? Yeah, this, this is Darren from ATE. Um, I do take your point. However, the tests that have all been cancelled so far are during this academic year. The tests that we're proposing at the moment are for the next academic year. and. We're all planning at the minute with a crystal ball on one hand and a rabbit's foot in the other hand. Um, in other words, we're all working in the dark. So what we've tried to do is provide a bit of clarity. But as the weeks and months roll on, I'm sure it will be very much a, a conveyor belt and we will see how things move at that point. But at the minute, we're providing clarity for these tests. I think that's all we can do at the moment. Um, well, that's not really an acceptable answer. You know, clarity in this situation is not going to, not going to lessen the load on families um, in this time of crisis. Again, how is it acceptable for the, the examinations to be cancelled for 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, but to say to 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds, guys, sorry, you have to sit the exam. How is that acceptable? Again, I go back to my point that none of the academic tests have been cancelled for the academic year 2021, um, and we'll wait and see what happens after the summer. Okay, in relation to fees, AQE AQ, and um, have a £55 registration fee, £20 which is refundable, and £35 non refundable if the exams are cancelled. Explain that, please. Uh, this is Darren again from AQE. AQE is a, a small company and it operates from the fees of the parents. Um, it costs us a substantial amount of money to process the applications, not just to produce the exams, and that money would be required during the processing stage. Um, and that's why we've set that fee and the level of return and refund. And what's the situation with PPTC fund or fees, please? Uh, PPTC doesn't doesn't charge uh, parents at all. So uh, parents are free when register. Um, there will never be any cost to them. And is there is there any rationale in AQE saying that that registration fee should be waived given the, the current circumstances? Again, Darren. Again, again, we're a small private company, and these tests cost money. Mm -hmm cost money to mark them, cost money to set them, cost money to administer them, and unless we charge the fee, uh, we couldn't provide them. Okay, both AQE and PPTC, PPTC have said tests will be um, deferred for a number of weeks. What level of consultation took place between both companies and uh, schools, school leaders, teachers and parents before that decision was arrived at? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Both AQE, uh, sorry, both AQE and PPTC have said the test will be, preferred, would be deferred by a number of weeks. What consultation took place with 
school leaders, teachers and parents in advance of that decision being arrived at? Uh, can I answer that from AQE's point of view? This is Darren again. AQE consulted with a substantial number of our member uh, schools. We also consulted with a, with a number of primary school principals and we consulted with some uh, parents and the overwhelming response was we need to move the tests after Christmas and that's why we asked the minister to move them by uh, to move the transfer deadline by 67 weeks. Out of curiosity, how many schools are working towards uh, phasing out entrance by exam or by academic selection? Um, that that wouldn't be something that we have figures for. You'd have to ask the individual schools. Um, a, a number of our schools are partially academically selected, um, but whether or not they get academic selection is a, is a matter for those individual schools. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, Catherine Morris, I'm conscious I, I didn't get to bring you in there. It's my understanding that the Education Minister has joined us. Do, are, are both of you content to um, move on to the Minister at this stage? Uh, yeah, listen, I, I have a question, but I can, I can submit it. Okay, uh, thank, thanks for that, Morris. Catherine? That's fine. That's okay. No I worries. Sincerely appreciate that, members. Uh, Darren, Carol, Ian, Bob, sincere thanks uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the first time AQE and PPTC have attended the Education Committee or not, but we're, we're very grateful um, for your attendance today. Uh, we've covered, obviously, a, a wide range of extremely important issues. And I, I'm wondering, would you be amenable to returning to the committee um, even in coming weeks, if we thought that that would be a helpful engagement to have? Yes, Chairman, we, we, I think I can speak for certainly AQE, we would be. Um, and it, it, it's been a good experience to talk to you and your committee members uh, and range over the very real problems that we know we are all facing. Uh, and opposite, I'm sure Karen will say the same. Mm. Well, I suppose it's an evolving situation, so we're not, not quite sure, I suppose, whether, whether there would be, maybe if there's necessity for us to go back, um, yeah, don't, well, I certainly will give a consideration. I don't think, don't think you need me to summarise the extent of the concern that exists in the community and therefore amongst members in relation to this, so I do feel that it, it may be an issue to which we would like to return with you, but we're, we're very grateful um, for the engagement that we've established with you and we, we wish you well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Okay, members, thank you. I'll ask the clerk to summarise that session after the next session, um, which is our Department of Education oral briefing on COVID-19 response. Uh, you have briefing paper from the clerk at page 36, departmental response on continuity of learning at page 109, progress update paper from EA on improving the statutory assessment process at page 116, uh, Correspondence from the Department on Notices, page 122, the DE COVID-19 Situation Report and Table Papers, and a copy of the SEA Consultation on the Exams Appeal Process in Table Papers. Can I confirm that Minister for Education, Peter Weir, MLA, is with us? Yes, can, can you hear me okay? I can indeed, Minister. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I think we have the Permanent Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of the Department as well. Um, we'd be glad to invite you to give us opening remarks, Minister. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I'll just keep this very brief because obviously the, um, uh, the, sort of the, the paper actually outlines where we are with the range of things. Members will be aware of, of developments. Uh, Minister, sorry to interrupt you. You're, you're very faint uh, to, to us in the Assembly. The line who aren't reading at the moment because I'm getting a lot of I can hear an awful lot of sort of um, noises which are not they're not coming from where I am but they're going to be coming sort of online but I'll try and talk as I'll talk as closely to the microphone talk as loudly as possible is that a bit better uh, yeah I, as as you say minister we would ask all members to mute their devices if possible to give the minister as best chance to be heard as possible and yeah if you could speak as loudly and clearly as possible minister thank you.
Okay, it's, it's not it's not normally um, traditionally a DUP politician is asked to actually increase their volume. Uh, but I'll, I'll, try oh, no. I'll, try, I'll try and speak as loudly as possible. Look, I'll take just initial remarks to uh, a minimum. Obviously, we've provided the, the update in terms of the situation report. These are the number of issues. Uh, obviously, I know you've had a session in terms of the position, particularly of, of AQE and PPTC in terms of the transfer. We're also in a, a situation where this year's eight primary, um, that broadly speaking, while there be a slight delay, I think because of issues around the posting side of it, people will know within a day or two of, of when they were originally uh, intended that side of transfer. On issues around um, the school means, there has been obviously that progress in terms of uh, resolution between parents and the EA, uh, largely speaking on the issue of the, the bank accounts and a different group has been found in connection with that. The uh, eat well, live well situation as regards youth services and apps. The one problem is it's been successful to the point of being uh, fully subscribed, so there's work ongoing with the uh, community side of work on the childcare uh, side of things. Uh, EPA have obviously issued as regards uh, the appeals process. And obviously as well, all the different contacts, and I hope to be in a position that uh, a bit more detail will be provided to the executive and then the assembly uh, probably towards the end of next week. Uh, the executive, as everybody knows, has produced its overall plan to sort of provide a roadmap for recovery. Uh, and obviously, there are elements within that that relate directly to education. So we see sort of a flow through of um, seeing where if there can be expansion, if there's a need to expand where there are some key workers or indeed as people return to work, if the numbers of schools can, uh, can increase a little bit. But obviously, a lot of the focus is on the next academic year, where it's a phasing, first of all, of... Um, well, there are particular priority cohorts which need to be dealt with, first of all, but if the academic year starts, uh, hopefully then, dependent upon the wider medical advice and the situation then, that we can start to see a phase return. The new normal, I think, for schools, at least until we are at a point at which uh, there is, uh, we're in a much more progressed situation, uh, will be on the basis that there will be a mixture of school accountants and remote learning. Because I suspect that social distancing, for instance, will be with us for some period of time to come. Now, there's initial work that's been started in that, but I think we are very keen, uh, and there's conversations already started in this, on talking to a whole range of stakeholders. Uh, because it's not a question of DEA or anybody else trying to impose how particular solutions should happen. That's going to be a very informed decision. So, over the next few weeks, there will be a range of ongoing discussions with a whole range of stakeholders as to where we are how we tackle issues around social distancing, what provision needs to be put in place on things like TPE. Uh, I should also say as well, there has been progress and uh, a strategy developed in terms of the provision of IT equipment. Uh, and again, so all these things are uh, working through. But I suppose I'm happy uh, to myself, Permanent Secretary, Deputy Permanent Secretary, deal with whatever issues people want to um, raise with us, and we're happy to, to take those. Okay, thank, thanks, Minister. Minister, could I uh, the, the clerk has advised that it might be worth you trying to phone back in again. Um, uh, okay. My, my under okay. understanding is that you're just about audible on the live stream as well, and you've provided us with a range of helpful updates there, so um, keen to... Okay, I'll, 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 I'll stop and phone back in, okay? Okay, thanks, Minister. Uh, in, in the meantime, perhaps, Derek, if you can hear me, yeah? Yes, I can hear you, Chair, but there's, there's pretty severe interference on the line. I'm hearing other voices coming through, so it's very difficult to concentrate uh, over that. But nonetheless, I'll do my best. Okay. Can you hear me? I can, reasonably clear, but you're, you're right. There's been reverberation throughout today. Apologies. Is, the, is that the minister back? No. Okay. Derek? <laughs> I've been abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, can I? Look, there's a clear question here I think you or the minister can ask. Has an alternative method of payment for free school means for families without a bank account been established? Yes, Chair. Um, 1,665 cheques went out yesterday evening in the post. 
Um, that is the number of families who are eligible to receive payments in respect of free school meals, but who for whatever reason can't have bank accounts or haven't got bank accounts or we haven't got their details. It's not ideal. We are still pursuing the option of making direct payments in those accounts where they exist, but there are real technical problems with that, and in particular with breaking into the Department for Work and Pensions Benefit System, and we daren't uh, compromise the integrity of that. But yes, payments went out yesterday evening to the outstanding families who are not getting payments directly into their bank accounts. Okay. And actually, there was, there was another run of direct payments today to about um, 60,000 families, so that brings the total amount paid out to nearly 10.5 Five million. Okay, I think that's extremely helpful information in light of concerns um, on that matter. Derek, do you, do you know approximately when those checks will be received or confident as per normal via the mail? Yeah, I hesitate to say, Chair, that the check is in the post, but it literally is in the post. Okay. So we're, we're at the mercy of uh, Royal Mail, okay? Okay. Um, is that any better? Slightly better, yeah. Still, still okay. speak as loud and clear as you can, Minister. Thanks. Okay. Um, that, um, I, one other question. Um, in, in terms of uh, post-primary transfer that we addressed in, in COVID-19 and, uh, and sticking to the very immediate um, issues, the, the, the witnesses um, suggested that they had requested a, a delay of up to set approximately seven weeks, I think. Um, it, do Department of Education and, and the Education Authority timetables for admissions um, restrict the amount of delay that can be offered? Well, realistically, um, Chair, what, we went through this in fine detail with the Education Authority, with the organisations themselves. It is a complex process that wants you to create that post-primary transfer because while people will think of the immediate positioning of somebody getting a place, you also have to build within the system um, a level of time scale for, instance, for the appeal to take place. Uh, and the problem is that in terms of placement, it tends to be a range of sequential steps that are to be taken. Now, in doing that, we looked at whether there is any way things should be tightened in terms of time frame and, uh, if you like, time reduced out of the process. And I think there was identification of maybe about a fortnight that should be taken out. But the problem is that if you were to do, for example, examinations in January, you wouldn't then be producing results, what we've been told by APA, until the middle of March. And even with taking whatever time could be taken, it would mean that for some pupils, they would not get a final placement uh, on appeal until some stage in, in October. So realistically, winding back the clock, from that, it really means that, that uh, if the tests are to be used, there wasn't really any other option other than being facilitated before Christmas. And that, I think, is just something, albeit reluctantly, the, the organisation accepted. I think it was always the intention of PPTC to do their test in December. So um, they were left of a, a direct issue in regard to that. Okay. I suspect other members will have questions, so I'll try and be extremely prompt, Minister. Um, the other issue raised was location and social distancing in location of tests. Is that something that you've considered? Well, ultimately, the, uh, directly speaking, the test, it is a private organisation that is running them. However, in terms of, first of all, in terms of location, there isn't a particular restriction that has been put in any way by... Uh, the department, indeed, previously, I'd given an indication through the memo that there was permission, for example, that if a test wasn't to be done in a primary school, there was no problem with, with doing that. So the choice and location lies with the organisation. Now, what I suspect with social distancing, assuming we are still in that position come November, December, I think that that will probably be a driver for the test to be spread over a greater number of locations. But it, it, in the same way as, as uh, we would look towards schools to be able to facilitate pupils in a different way uh, and with cohorts and numbers, 
I think it's what it does present probably is the opportunity where there would be a need for a greater overall volume of physical space. But at first instance, that is an issue uh, which we're happy to work alongside others, but really for the success organisation themselves to spoke about. But that, that does seem to be something that's fairly soluble, I would have thought. Okay. The, the other issue that was the other issue that was raised was the the, the, the different availability and capacity of parents to contribute to remote learning at this stage. Um, the one question was, can any assistance be offered to, in particular, key workers? Um, from my point of view, I, I, my question is, how, how, how is it possible for this to be a fair system in the three months of no school and then other months potentially of school and remote learning? And, well, and, and therefore, what contingency plan is in place? Well, first of all, I think that any assistance will be looking as part of the recovery process to particularly give support uh, to key years, of which P7, for instance, will be one of those. And you'll see within that that there will be a focus particularly on those, those cohorts. That's, that's part of the overall executive plan. Is everything going to be entirely fair? You know, I don't think we do have a perfect system. We're trying to operate on the basis of, of what is there. In terms of remote learning, uh, we want to try and ensure there's as much consistency between schools as possible, and there has been some level of variation um, within that. And it's a question, I, I suppose, of uh, for everybody there will be difficulties. We will try and support that remote learning. And I know, but it is also the case, there's, it's not been a question of, um, maybe this is sounds a little bit pedantic, but it's not been a question if there hasn't been three months of school. There may well have been three months of people not being in school, but education has continued. Teaching has continued. Learning has, has continued. It is not as perfect as if people are clearly, if pupils are in school. But let us not slip into the narrative of simply presenting this effectively as people more or less have simply been off for a period of time. That work has gone on. Yeah, which, which is absolutely not what we're doing. Teachers have gone above and beyond their vocation to try and help pupils. But I, I can't expect that you think you, that teachers alone can overcome the inequitable circumstances that children find themselves in. And, and that's, that's undoubtedly the case on it. I think we will have to do as much as can be done, but we are not living in perfect situations. And it comes back to ultimately the issues around, particularly with regard to the issue of transfer, that you will have a range of schools, whatever anybody's doing this, you will have a range of schools which are oversubscribed. Legally, uh, those schools are entitled, if they so wish, to use academic selection as a means of doing that. Realistically, from the point of view of transfer, the only practical way that can be done is by way of some form of examination or test. Similarly, if we're to have an examination or test, it has got to be one which can be delivered in a time frame which enables pupils to be able to transfer successfully to a, a post time rate. Okay. Frankly, if we have a time scale, which means that for some pupils, they would not be knowing what school they were going to until some point next, in October. That is simply something which is not an acceptable option. Okay. And um, what is the contingency plan if tests cut, simply can't take place? Well, I think that, I think we need to work on assessed campus, but I don't believe. I think in terms of the fact that uh, activity can take place by way of social distancing, you know, the reality is that that is something that all of us will be facing, and indeed in all walks of life. I think the, the issue would simply be to what extent will adjustments have to be made uh, to do that. But ultimately, I suppose, again, in terms of the arrangements. The arrangements are ultimately for the testing organisations that they will have to make choice. We will work alongside them, but we cannot impose a particular uh, solution on them. So I think we've got to work to actually ensure that that that, uh, that transfer happens, uh, happens in as smooth a way as possible. Uh, and I think that uh, anything that we move beyond is, is, is suboptimal in its, in its, on its basis. Okay. Minister, broadcasting have asked if there's any way you can dial in again on a landline. Um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try that. But again, look, I, I would say as well, that goes something that the permanent site says. We seem to be getting quite a, net, a bit of interference coming back in. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, keen to bring members in. Karen, 
do you wish to ask a question of the permanent secretary while we wait for the minister to come back for you? Yep. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Derek, uh, for attending this week again and providing the update. I think we're, we are seeing we're working our way through. Uh, I think I thank you particularly in your speedy action around the free school meal payment after we just raised it last week. So thanks for that. And also, commend, I want to commend the youth service and the work they're doing around just the Eat Well, Live Well, but staying connected online with support services um, and the, the support services like the, sanctuary, the Spaces of Sanctuary, which I know has had to be used for a few young people in my city. So I just want to put that on record and commend the work that is happening there. Derek, just in relation, I know there's an update on the paper, but I'm sure many members will be asking again, has there been progress made in relation to the sub-teachers' pay around any information coming back from the Treasury or the ability to be able to furlough the, the, the sub-teachers? Well, there's been... Uh, uh, can people hear me okay? Yes, yeah, yeah. I phoned in, phone in, phone in on a landline here. Yeah, that's oh, thank you. Thank you. There, look, there, there has been a lot of work that has gone on between ourselves and, and finance. Um, I think the latest position, and, and obviously as part of that, a joint letter was set, submitted to Treasury. It was raised directly with Treasury by the finance minister. Um, I think there are, we're still waiting for a formal response to Treasury. Uh, however, I think there are concerns about whether that, that response will be positive or not. And I think as part of that, then there's consideration between ourselves and, and finance about the means through which we can bring this, this forward. That may require something that, that may have to be examined directly by the executive as, as a whole, but we want to try and bring that to a conclusion as, as quickly as possible. We, uh, we, we got that. As I know how hard everybody's working to get this resolved, and, and uh, we got that information last week, Minister. Is there any indication the time frame members will be like myself? Well, I think, I think, I think, every day? I think, I think, look, I think the issue is we're working. I, no, I appreciate that. I think the, the mm -hmm. feeling, I think, is that in terms of providing a solution, if uh, I think if between purely ourselves and finance, we could do it directly. But I think there's a feeling that any proposal that needs to be put will need to actually go to the executive as a whole. That seems to be the indications, particularly from the Department of Finance. So we would be working to try and get that turned around as, as quickly as possible on that basis. You know, I, I don't have any particular objection if there was finance was saying, here's, here's the solution uh, that between education and others that, that will, be, will be done, and we could just do it immediately. But I think the feeling is that given the fact that the level of public money that would be involved, that there may have to be something that is directly put to the executive. So uh, I think that we'll try and get that done as quickly as, as possible in that regard. But there's no guarantee, uh, you know, in a wider sphere, given all the other pressures, what the, the level of things that is doable in that regard. We are against a, a broader situation, to be fair to, to the Department of Finance, to be fair to the executive as a whole, in which the amount of, of money that is being sought across the system of government you know, is maybe two or three times at least what is available to spend. So, you know, these things will not be easy in that, in that regard. But there will be a, in circumstances in which we don't get a positive response out of Treasury, there will be a level of support from the Department of Education. But could we go as far as we, we could if in the absence of some level of additional um, external support? No, I, I, I wouldn't want to uh, indicate to people that, that, that we could, because that's simply not a, a reality given where the budget pressures are. Thank you. Um, you give us an update there in, uh, around the, what possibly could look like and we, and we, we, we can't fully plan given the current situation around staggered learning um, and, in, and that you're, obviously there's a lot of work being done. So what I was going to say was in relation to working with others, but you've already updated it in terms of that that will be a wide engagement and all of that. So just if we could see that, um, get a bit more information in the coming weeks in relation to what that's going to look like. Uh, okay. And that sort of brings me on to the point around, I suppose there's a lot of anxiety, um, Minister, and you would be hearing it in relation to those children who would be transitioning and what yeah. kind of support that we can be putting in place for them. And I suppose over and above educational, so for children transitioning from primary school to post-primary, leaving their school, leaving their friends and all of that. Um, and again, I know it's going to be led in terms of the current pandemic and how sick it is to do it. 
and, and I'm sure the department is working on that, but it, it, it would be very important that they are working very, very closely with schools and pupils and no, parents. No, and, and as, part of, as part of the thing, I suppose, one of, one of the reasons why maybe there's a limit to how definitive we can be actually is because yes. there will be a range of ongoing conversations. It's not, it's not really our position. I mean, ultimately, there will be very clear guidance that will be issued to schools. There will be direction given and a range of issues, but that's got to be entirely informed from that uh, discussion with a whole range of schools uh, and the school leaders, parents, pupils as well, uh, to try and feed in that information to get as good a solution as, as possible. So, you know, I, I don't want to jump in, if you like, at the start of that process, and we do have a little no. bit of time to do that. Look, yeah. I, I'm acutely aware for, for everybody um, that uh, those who are, particularly those who are transitioning, for instance, this year between P7 and um, uh, and the schools themselves, or those who are moving from preschool into into school, yes. and also those who are actually leaving school. You know, this is an incredibly yes, difficult time. Thing. They're not getting the opportunity, even on the basis of both from a a broader smooth transition, but even from the point of view of of uh, the difficulties that will be there of being able to say goodbye to their friends. You know, yes. I, I suppose if there's if there's any way that that can be facilitated in some way, yes. I suppose particularly the concern will be. It's very difficult to do things, for instance, in terms of either inductions or um, some form of leaving side of it while maintaining entirely social distancing. Uh, yeah. human, in, human instincts to, to reach out to one another, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's counterproductive a little bit in that regard. So that would be where the difficulties will be um, yeah. on that basis. But, you know, there is no doubt that this will be an incredibly difficult year of movement for anybody who's in that, that situation, more so, I think, even to be fair, than even those who are simply uh, moving up, up from within from within a particular school. Yeah, that 100%. Yeah. That, was the, that was the three different uh, uh, stages that I was going to mention, Dee. And whilst maybe we can't physically be able to go back on the building, it's how we're able to do, maybe do that virtually. And I'm not sure if you heard, as you were coming back on the conversation, I was commending the Education Youth Service so they have, obviously, there are a number of ways and models we can do it. And as I say, I know that there's probably plans in place, but a lot of parents are asking us in relation no, to that. Thank, and thank to take, you to, take, to take one example, which is a different, um, different part of the, 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 the process, and this will not be particularly a school-related issue. There's also about how we look, both in terms of some level of provision for key workers over the summer period, but also, I suppose, there, there's an issue as well, which I think the likes of youth service, but also voluntary and community organisations can play a role in. You know, to what extent do we look, and again, there's no meat being put on the bones in terms of decisions taken in this, but how do we enable some levels of interaction, for instance, between um, young people over the summer in terms of, while observing social distancing, while observing, uh, if we're talking about numbers, you know, what is there uh, around... You know, do we have some form of limited, say, particularly run by the youth service, some level of summer schemes for individual cohorts, or you know, all those things? There's no particular answer to directly at this stage, yeah. but I, I think they should be part of the conversation. And yeah. to some extent, if we are looking particularly at um, how things are handled from a school perspective in uh, in in the autumn, um, getting our heads around, I think, um, the interaction between young people is critical. Um, <laughs> Particularly, for example, um, in circumstances where what physically can be done in the classroom, um, I think, can be worked through, and there is particular. Scope. I think sometimes where the bigger challenge is going to be, and it's a wider challenge for society, is uh, you know, how do we help and support young people when they're not in the classroom? What is the level of socialisation? What is the level of interaction between young people? And I think we've got to reach sensible positions as, as, as time marches on uh, with that as well. Okay. Obviously, yeah, obviously suppose, driven by whatever the medical evidence is as well. Of course, it'll be all part of the plan and working through these stages. Um, okay. And Minister, I just want to finish off. Um, I know we're, we're never going to agree on this, but I just want to make the point. If I wasn't convinced this mor before this morning of the inequality and fairness, unfairness of selection, I certainly am now. It will be, the, you know, this year we'll see children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds more disadvantaged, most, dis most disadvantaged and more disadvantaged in this process. And it's just really a comment, and I, I know your position. No, I don't, and, and, and I appreciate it. And, and I think, shall we say, um, that debate and division over the issue of selection is, is 
almost certainly likely to outlive coronavirus. <laughs> Definitely. No, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think we have a wee bit more of a responsibility than to just leave it at that, to be honest with you, but we need to leave it at that for now. Uh, I, went, I, don't, I don't want to restart it, so let, let me bring in Daniel. He might restart it. Daniel? <laughs> you, you're trying to put me in a bad corner. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, good to have you on, Minister, and Derek as well this week again. But Derek, I can't help but say that I am a wee bit heartbroken today because you made me a commitment last week that you would hope that you wouldn't be sitting here repeating the same line around some teachers this week and unfortunately it seems that we're going to be hearing the same line this week and i would probably think next week well uh, the, sorry, sorry. can i just acknowledge that point i mean i knew daniel you were going to say that to me and i'm a bit heartbroken too okay so i just have to put my hands up and say mea culpa but the minister has explained where we are, and he is working very, very hard with the finance minister on this. I'm not going to make any more commitments on this point because I've had my fingers burned. But I just acknowledge your point. I have no response to it, you know, except to say I would hope next week, you know, this will be resolved. I would, I would, I would, I would don't, don't, don't overcommit too much because whilst you have your fingers uh, burnt this week, they might be cut off next week. <laughs> The, the, ju just in relation to this, Minister uh, and Derek, I, I appreciate that this is not a straightforward situation. I appreciate that we haven't got an endless pot of money. I appreciate that there is a huge demands on the budget. But I also uh, am very clear on the huge and devastating impact that this is having on a large number of, of uh, relatively young people who have invested in their education in order to better the lives of our children here and have remained here in Northern Ireland uh, where uh, many of their their, their uh, peers have went to uh, other parts uh, of uh, the country. The, the, this is presenting significant issues. It's also damaged the confidence of these people in the system uh, because they are now, some of which are considering other alternatives to teaching uh, because of how this has left them. Uh, they have no confidence. Uh, whatsoever that this is going to be resolved. And Minister, I know that you are seeing the many stories that are going around Facebook and social media because I've seen that you've been engaging with these people directly. Uh, indeed, you've been engaging with me directly, and I appreciate that. But I, I, I understand that, yes, a bit needs to be made. But these people have been told now for six weeks that this will be sorted out. And my issue with this is when we do get to a resolution around it, and I accept and I appreciate your commitment that that will be the case. How long before these people get money into their bank accounts? Because these are, this is a real life situation. These, are, these people have mortgages, rent, uh, they have families to feed. We, I heard the story yesterday of, of a young teacher who is pregnant, no income whatsoever. There's, there's big issues uh, in relation to this. Uh, and, and, Minister, to be very honest, um, it's, it's just become very, very frustrating. Is there nothing can be done in the interim, like an interim payment of some measure well, to alleviate the pressure on these individuals? No, look, I, I understand that, look, and I understand there's incredible difficulties for people out there. I, I suppose, Daniel, I'd make just two or three points in relation to this. First of all, in terms of producing a solution, I think the problem is uh, whatever solution is going to be there will be less than perfect. If it is left purely to finance it, by the Department of Education, it will be less than even less than perfect. So I could make an announcement today of what the Department of Education could do, but there would be no guarantee it could go beyond that. And the problem would be that would be pitching something at a level which is less than I would hope to try and get uh, for those. So some of the answers on this will come from other people, and that has been where our hands have been somewhat what tied. I would also say that we will do all that we can to ensure that things are processed as quickly as possible. However, here's where the complexity on this will lie in terms of doing this. If you were talking about uh, paying people and they would be paid effectively on, if I may use the phrase, what, what they would have expected to have worked rather than, by definition, the actual sort of timesheets of when they've been in, the way to judge that will be according to the level of, of work that they received in the January to March period. Because as I'm sure, I know you're acutely aware of the situation as regards to substitute teachers, it will vary between some people who have effectively, at one end, may well have been working four or five days a week with that 
to others who are on the substitute list who may, may well have done one day a month. And so, therefore, any payments have got to be based upon um, effectively pro rata with the amount of work that was done in those first three months, which will require a level of, of processing to take place. We will do all that we can when we reach the point of an amount that that, that scheme will will provide money as quickly as possible. But you know, I have no doubt that there, there will be. It is not something which can be instantly turned around with the press of a buck, neither in that in that regard. Because you're not, you know, this isn't just a cohort, as I said, where there's just a level amount of work, and where therefore everybody is in the same position. That there's massively different uh, different positions uh, between people, and massively different levels of work to which it would be reflected on. Okay, Daniel. Yeah. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, just very brief, very briefly. I have five more members in, I think, ten minutes. So please be as concise as you possibly can. Yeah, it's, it's just just a, a point on that. Minister, please do everything possible, and Derek as well, over the next week to get some confidence back into the situation and to ensure and reassure uh, that these people can get something, because that's what this is about. No, yeah. Daniel, look, that, that, that is the case, but as with, as with things have been for a period of time, either the timing or the full level of decisions are not entirely within our hands. We will do all that we can to push the thing, but we can't, we can't give a guarantee in terms of, in terms of timing uh, or the exact position of, of where resolution will be, because it's not, it's not a decision which I can take or others can take, which will just be simply by myself or by the department. Yeah, but Minister, you, you've mentioned that in the event that the bid is unsuccessful to the Treasury, that something will have to be done from the department anyway. And I'm there, there, will be, there will be, but I think that, that you know, realistically that you can either do that of something of a single run by the Department of Education, or you can do that as part of a package working with uh, the executive as a whole to make sure that, that package is a bit larger. What I think would be particularly difficult would be for us to announce something, then to try to get something else out of the thing, and then have almost like a second, a second sort of fund in that regard. It's, it's an awful lot better that it will be as part of the one, the one position in relation to it. As I said, I, I hope, and there's been good work being done with, with the Department of Finance. They've been very cooperative throughout this. But again, it's, it's about securing that level of funding that, that can provide some level of then support for uh, for the substitute teachers. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. And Chair, just a very brief point, and it is very brief. Uh, it's just in relation to a presentation received last week, Minister, uh, and I'm conscious you weren't there, but Derek uh, was speaking to us afterwards around childcare, uh, and there has been a scheme designed. Uh, my concern followed on from the actual design of the scheme to the rollout of the money that will be vitally important to the sector. And I was very concerned to learn that only five processing people will be in place at the BSO to get this money out. Uh, it was our view that that was nowhere near adequate or sufficient in order to ensure a very uh, swift rollout of these funds. Uh, and we, we we're just wondering, Minister, have you had any engagement in relation to well, that? I think, would you express I think, concern in relation to I think, look, I, I think there's been there's ongoing engagement with BSO. It's obviously the Department of Health. And I think we stand ready if, there's, if it's an issue of additional personnel that's needed or additional help, we are more than happy to provide that and try and support that. Okay. Um, can I that's jump in there just, just very briefly. quickly, Chair? Yeah, just briefly. say we, we have a daily meeting with colleagues in the Department of Health and BSO um, about this scheme. We are monitoring the progress with it. And as the Minister says, if resourcing is a problem, we are prepared to allocate more resources. It is too early yet, after really two days of applications coming in, to assess the speed at which they are being processed. Only a, a relatively small number of applications have arrived so far, but we will monitor this on a daily basis to make sure that staff resources is not an impediment to the speedy processing of applications. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Two very brief follow-ups to that, uh, Minister. The childcare is not referenced within the Northern Ireland Executive Coronavirus Recovery Plan. I don't know whether that can be amended at a later stage, but it seems to be an, an unfortunate oversight. I know it can't include everything, but it should be in there in some shape or form. What, 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 I, what I would say is, yeah, look, we're very conscious of the situation. Not everything is within... Uh, that plan, because the specific points as regards education were specifically to reference the, the situation as regards as regards schools. Okay. I think we may well be in a situation where childcare moves in a different time frame. Uh, you know, there may well be, as part of the overall picture, as evidence develops, 
there may be things that can be done, for instance, in childcare which are not doable within schools. Okay, I'll maybe come back to that if time allows me, it may not. Brief question, time scale for substitute teacher payment is out with your control, but can I ask you, will substitute teachers receive a, ho a payment? Will, will they receive? Yes, I mean, you're basically saying, will, th will there be at least some money that will be available? Yes. Yes. Okay, moving on then. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and again, thank the Minister and uh, Derek for, for coming along to, to the committee. Minister, can just uh, mention one area. Uh, I was pleased to see the uh, level of uh, online learning that's taking place. 96% of schools reported and 100% of post-primary schools, 95% of primary schools and 92% of special schools. And those figures are, are indeed a great credit to the teachers. We spent in the previous session talking around the transfer test and indeed some areas that were of concern uh, to, to members. And I myself have received a number of, of queries from constituents on the matter. You also indicate in the report, Chair, that priority areas for external report, and you've listed uh, where there are guidance on supporting parents. And I would obviously be very keen to see that those parents in, obviously, where there are low incomes or in deprived or disadvantaged areas might uh, be high on that list. Could you, Minister, just explain or Derek explain just what that means, guidance on supporting parents? Well, I'll maybe hand over to Derek directly on this one in terms of the detail of that. Yeah, okay, thank you, Minister. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of applications, a lot of programs in place to support home learning, but obviously that's new to many people. So in addition to that, there is guidance online, both to teachers themselves, and actually there's training being provided by Stranmillis College, and also to parents, how to make the most out of online learning and how to use it, how best to use it. So that's effectively what that means. And just while I'm on the subject of online learning, and maybe I don't want to preempt a question that's coming up, but the, the, the minister has recently agreed a three-pronged strategy on the making available digital devices uh, to uh, particular pupils who may benefit from it on the basis of feedback that we have got from schools. Um, the three prongs being repurposing existing equipment which exists in schools. The second prong being repurposing a consignment of laptops which is already in procurement to the education authority and then thirdly putting in place a new procurement altogether to acquire a large number of suitable tablets which can be purposed for education purposes and I think the committee will hear more about that next week when it gets a specialized briefing on uh, distance learning. Well, that, that, that certainly is uh, good news, uh, Derek. Um, I, I, w I would like to uh, have a constituent contact the office this morning who is determined that uh, they, they are going to provide five tablets to a school. I thought it was a very generous offer by, by someone. Uh, but okay. could, could I just ask, Derek, in terms of that, uh, the guidance on supporting parents, is it targeted at any areas, or can it be targeted at any areas can it, to help those youngsters, perhaps who and parents who are perhaps struggling with this new learning experience for them? Um, I don't think the guidance is specifically targeted at any particular cohort or group or geographical area. It is generic guidance that is out there for the benefit of all parents. I think at a local level, um, it would be for individual schools to assess what would be the best support that could be provided to the parents of the pupils who attend their school. But I think as a central resource, it's very difficult to target that specifically at different groups. Um, so I think it's a bit of both and at local level, support from schools, but at a generic level, online support from the centre. I, I, think, I think as well, this is probably something that I mean, there will be a pool of information which 
as time marches on, will grow in terms of that level of support that's there, in terms of both online resources, online guidance that is there. Probably I think there is also a role beyond the formal education system um, for, for instance, the voluntary community sector, because some of this will be also making people aware that this is available. And I think getting the message out there, the more sources of information that we can use to get messages out there of what is available, I think every opportunity should be taken. Okay. Okay, to remove okay, one, Robin. Sure. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, uh, Catherine. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister Derek and John, for meeting with us again today. My contribution in relation to the transfer test is more of a comment than a question. Like other members, I have had many messages and calls from very frustrated parents and also teachers. Um, many had assumed that the test would be cancelled, similar to the GCSE and A-level examination. They believe that the two-week delay is not sufficient under the current circumstances, and especially if children face a staggered return to school. And I agree, it is absolutely unreasonable to ask 10-year-olds to sit a test when they have missed five months of teaching and preparation. Children have had their world turned upside down, and many are under significant pressure with the huge changes inflicted upon them. I believe that the transfer test in ordinary circumstances poses a huge risk to the mental health and well-being of our children, never mind the worry, stress and pressure they're under right now. Should their mental health and well-being not be paramount, paramount in how this is handled, they do not need another hurdle to jump when they return to school. Their final few months at primary school should really be carefree, um, cementing their friendships and actually enjoying the learning experience. And that's, that's really just a, a comment um, okay. coming from the, the previous meeting. Um, my uh, question, um, I'm going to refer to the child care package. Um, since the application forms were received on Friday, I've been contacted by numerous providers who are extremely frustrated at the bureaucratic way in which they have had to apply for support. Um, many are under immense pressure to collect all relevant documentation and fear missing something out, which in turn will result in a delay, further delay to their application. Are both departments at this stage planning for how settings will operate on the other side of this? Will there be an extension to the support package currently being rolled out, as we know the package is only available from April to June? Well, look, uh, Catherine, if I can answer, I'll, I'll obviously take the first bit uh, for the sake of brevity as, as, as a sort of a comment. I appreciate um, your position in relation to that. Uh, look, in terms of the, the package, I think our initial bid to the executive had actually been for effectively a six-month package. Uh, and as such, we received a level of funding that would take things through to the end of June. Certainly, I think there will need to be a reassessment about what level of support is, is needed. A package will require the support of the, the executive moving forward. Um, and as such, uh, you know, I think if, if we simply reach people to a point at which nothing else is done for them post the 30th of June, I think there is a danger of the, the impact on the broad child care, care setting settings but that that you know that will depend ultimately upon the executive providing um, additional and longer support uh, whether the position we are in a slightly different position at the end of June whether there's some level of reassessment about what is needed uh, you know I, I can't prejudge that at this stage uh, and as indicated I think Derek as Derek indicated earlier uh, while the department or indeed any arm's length body of the department is not the one doing the processing of that uh, we are daily sort of conference uh, with the Department of Health, with BSO, to try to make sure that, that things are not overly bureaucratic and they are smooth, but, you know, there's a lot of detail that will be required, so it's, it's not going to be necessarily an easy process on that, um, on that, on that basis, but we are acutely aware of that, and we're acutely aware that it's not just, if you like, getting over a very short-term hump as regards childcare, it's about actually where we land in the longer run with the, the issue. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, okay. Sorry, I would just add that there is a helpline to support people who are applying for the child care package, and we will monitor the kind of comments coming through on the helpline to see whether and how we can be more helpful. Okay. I, Thank I, you, Gary. Catherine, thanks for that question. I've, I've also asked that the health minister might consider providing a 
uh, an update on the child care scheme in his statement uh, to the Assembly uh, on Thursday, tomorrow, so we might get some more detail, but uh, I'm conscious that there are officials working um, extensively behind the scenes on this scheme. I think we do just need a bit more information, as you've said, Catherine. Okay, um, can I bring it? Yes, certainly, Catherine, go ahead. Just, just, just one final question, um, and it's in relation to the free school meeting. Um, is the de department considering how to tackle holiday hunger this summer? Will there be an extension of the current direct payment system for children and young people well, over the summer months? Again, that would be a question for the executive as a whole. I think the overall responsibility uh, in terms of ensuring that there is support for the vulnerable in terms of needs lies with the Department of, for Communities. So there would need to be, I think, an examination of what level of support there can be over the uh, over the summer. Obviously, as you're aware, free school meals don't normally take place over the summer. Uh, it is something which I think the executive as a whole will have to consider, but there isn't, certainly from the department's point of view, there isn't money in budget to do stuff over the summer. It wouldn't be something normally we would do as well. And I think in terms of what may well need to be looked at is there is a level of support that is being provided for vulnerable families across the board by the Department for Communities. If, if we can also be at a level of assistance to that, and I think one of the things that has been um, very successful has been the work that has gone on, for instance, with, with youth service and being able to act as a facilitator of that. And I think there is a resource there, I'm talking about human capital, which I think could be made use of, particularly by Department for Communities, along with councils, etc. So it's, it's got to be, it's going to be tackled. It's got to be tackled on an executive-wide basis. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I bring in Justin? Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I asked uh, the question of AQE and PPTC earlier in relation to A levels um, being cancelled, GCSEs being cancelled, leaving certs being cancelled. Junior search being cancelled, all moving to a non-exam assessment and predicted grades system. A huge burden has been lifted off the shoulders of 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds. But up here we're saying to 10-year-olds, you're okay, you manage, we're going we're to keep your exam in place. How is that acceptable in your view? Okay, Justin, thank you for the question. Let's be absolutely clear, and CCA have said this, and others said, I mean, first of all, I don't think it's a question of a burden being left out, because I think there's still a very difficult time for a lot of those, those young people. Let's be honest, we are doing what we have to do in terms of the A-levels, in terms of GCSE, because there is no other alternative this summer. And CCEA and other examination boards will tell you that the best solution, if it was available, is to do examinations. And obviously, for instance, that was the direction of travel in the Republic before they realized it was utterly impractical on that, on that basis. So if there is an opportunity to examinations, that is a better result. Now, we are also able on those to use the levels of data alongside the, the uh, teacher prediction. You know, for example, is there a, a desire or indeed a willingness, I suspect, amongst many teachers to be able to provide, you know, leaving aside that would be a less than perfect solution compared with examinations, um, is there a willingness um, or a desire for teachers at primary level to make that assessment, uh, make that level of ranking of, of their pupils, having comparabilities between primary schools because they're not doing, if you like, um, the same level of, of state examinations that you can then have comparators between because that, that is where the area centre balancing can, can take place. So you would have a, a, an even less than perfect situation on that basis on it. You have a situation where you would put, I think, uh, teachers at that level in a very invidious position, but also the system itself will only work at that level if you were to get buy-in as well of every teacher and every school. Because if you get some schools participating and others doing it, how can you have a comparison then between schools as to who gets, who gets selections? I think that would place schools in an invidious position. I think it would place teachers in an invidious position. It would actually be a, a system that would break down, I think, very quickly. On that, on that basis on it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think, and it, let me put it this way, if, if we were in a position that we could have gone ahead with examinations in, in the summer, that would have actually been a lot better situation than having to do levels of, of, of predictions uh, within that, but it just simply wasn't practical. Okay, thanks, Minister. Um, in relation to key worker children requiring places, um, I note that you, it's moved from a number of 181 
Uh, it's now at 39. What, what is the situation for those 39 key worker children who still need places? Well, we're, we're, we're working on that. The other factor within that is, um, which some of the figures slightly mask, within that 39 is, it will, it will fluctuate a little bit, but I think it's roughly about between 15 and 17 who are not actually seeking a placement immediately. So it may well be, for example, I'll, I'll just take a, an example, a key worker who is contacting the EA to say, uh, my local school is not, is not open. I want to get a school for my child. However, because of whatever way the shift patterns work, I will not need this until the 1st of June. So some of those figures will actually reflect people to which the places are not within that. Now, we've had, I think, roughly speaking, around about 500 requests. And as such, the vast bulk of them have been able to be. So it's, it's, an, ongoing, it's an ongoing work. It's not perfect. Uh, for those those children, but compared to where we were, and gradually day by day, that that, is, that number is getting drilled down. But you'll also get a, a there will be a slight element of churn as well, in that um, there will also be a reflection where some of those people, you you may in a particular day get a few people sorted out. You may then get a few new people who will then come onto the system saying, haven't needed one up until now. I'm now looking at a place. So you know there, there's always likely to be some small level of, of figure on it. But I, I think there has been considerable success in keeping that down to, um, and keep on reducing that very steadily. You know, as I said, at one stage, as you indicated, it was maybe in the region of a couple of hundred, and gradually that, that has been brought down and down. Okay. Can I jump in there just very quickly, Chair? A uh, couple of points. As the Minister says, it's not always the same children every day. We uh, survey it every day to see what the number is, but people move in and people move out of that. Another interesting fact that the committee won't be aware of, because it just came through yesterday, um, on Tuesday we had the highest number ever of pupils in schools since closure on the 23rd of March. So it's just interesting that the number of pupils is increasing every day. Yesterday it was up to 1,575. We probably had the highest number of schools open and we had 10 special schools open. So there seems to be a general trend upwards in all of the figures. Okay, thanks, Derek. In terms of ICT, um, and I know the move is towards more blended learning, and some, some school leaders are not sure what that actually entails specifically. Um, some school resources are at, uh, at least six years old in terms of their ICT. They are two years over contract at least. Um, has there been an ICT audit done, especially given the move towards that blended learning where kids are having to access online learning portals? Um, yeah, so has there been an audit done of ICT capability within schools? Well, I, I think from, from that point of view, Justin, our, our main aim is to try to make sure that there are at least availability of, of devices that are there. Uh, you know, I think what is out there is not is not perfect, and that's part of the the process. For instance, that uh, in terms of an ongoing procurement order, which was taking place, for instance, via the, the EA. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know. Let me put it this way: the aim is to try and get where it is needed equipment to to everybody, and particularly in, at first instance to those who are vulnerable on that basis, those who are in key years, and then as part of that. Uh, you know, gradually, as, as for instance, we bring in new stuff, then we can try and ratchet that up uh, as well as, per, uh, as possible. But I think, from the point of view of ensuring that, that everybody has the most up-to-date possible equipment, is probably at least in the foreseeable future not particularly realistic, to be honest, on that on that basis. Okay. Can the minister? Uh, can you clarify, minister? Has a scheme been designed for sub-teachers, and has the minister for finance asked the Department for Education to fund it within existing budgets? Well, there's a broadly, uh, let me put it this way, there's been a broad, in terms of the, the scheme, the, the broad outline which is essentially saying that whatever people would get uh, will be based upon the level of work that, that is there that they were receiving between January and March, and you would be looking at a at, at some level of proportion of that. Um, yeah, so from that point of view, there's a level of detail, but even if you've got a something that was off the shelf, there will still be a, a, quite a bit of processing that will be required. The, the, the finance minister has said to every bid that has come in, um, there is a, a cross-departmental message, which is, uh, and whether it's substitute teachers, whether it is, you know, support for a particular sector of the economy or whatever, um, the message that has come, understandably, from the Department of Finance is, 
uh, people need to look at what resources are available within their own department first before they make a bid and see if they can be met from within that. So it is clear that if there is a if there's not a solution which comes from Treasury, that that will have to be, if you like, self-funded from within the the executive, to which I think um, a large proportion of that uh, will come from the Department of Education. But what I'm saying is there's limitations to what we can do and what available resources are there compared with, um, given all the other pressures that are there, if we're to get the best possible solution, it will require some level of external. But that message in the Department of Finance has gone out to, to basically every bid that has been made. It's, it's a generic message in that regard. I'm not saying it's, it's a wrong message in that regard, but I think that, that's sent out to all departments. Okay, are you indicating, Minister, that the initial response from Treasury has not been positive? Well, I think uh, we have not received a formal response from that, uh, in part because in terms of direct connections with, with Treasury, the direct lines of communication, Treasury doesn't report to individual devolved departments. Uh, what they will do is they will, they will make that through the DOF. Uh, I would just say that I think the, the indications that, that DOF are, are seem to be making is that they are not, I think it would be fair to say they are not confident of a positive response. They have not received, I think, to the best of my knowledge, they have not received a formal response off Treasury, but I think they are not, they are not encouraged that, that, that everything is going to be positive from Treasury, put it that way. In relation to transport purveyors, Minister, can you confirm the contracts with transport purveyors have been honoured in full to the end of June? Yes, that, 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 that is the correct. I mean, I, I had, had an issue. I know that there was, I think, in some cases, a little bit of, of delay, and there is, I think, within the, the paper, outlining of where sometimes transport providers have had to maybe make choices because clearly, to take an example, if they're doing things with regards to furloughing staff, will have an impact uh, on that, and there are certain choices in relation to that. But yes, they, they have been um, honoured for that, is what we're being told by the EA. Now, uh, at times, there can be delays within that. Uh, and I think there sometimes can be at least breakdown of communications between sometimes the providers and some of their employees. So, you know, it, it's a complex picture in that regard. But, yeah, no, it's it as, as indicated in the, in the report that we've given. Okay, I know Chair, as we mentioned already, Minister, is going to play such an important role in kick-starting our economy again. Um, can you comment as to why there was no mention of childcare in the executive's roadmap? I've indicated that already because the particular aspect in, within the, um, the detailed examples given we're specifically looking at schools. The, the point is to some extent that the childcare side of it is something which I think can move on, uh, may well be in a position actually to move on independently as regards that it may require, given that even just the time frame of businesses are in a different position to what schools are providing, it's, it's a kind of a different uh, position, but I'm acutely aware of the situation as regards to childcare. Okay, Justin. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank yeah. you, Derek. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Justin. Robbie? Thank you, Chair. Minister and Derek, thank you so much again. Uh, you guys have been available just about a week. We are truly, truly appreciate that and the work you've done. But, uh, Minister, I do have to say that I am disappointed with regard to uh, the HUE test and, and what has happened so far. From what I've heard, and it certainly looks like it, that um, setting aside any arguments to whether it's appropriate or not for kids, that the system is drawn so tight and the string in the bow is so tight that there's no flexibility, no ability in it um, to, to prove that it's a, a, a pupil focused uh, uh, system that we have at the moment. Because basically, what we've heard um, today is that any further delay than the COVID could throw this back into October. Um, out for a pain. Um, that being the case, that would indicate that the system is far, far too tight and inflexible. Um, I, I would just ask in, in this instance, are you absolutely certain that there's no agility and no further measures or steps that can be taken um, to put the, the, the people first in this instance, um, to, to, to try and alleviate all of the inequalities that have been well covered by the members so far in this meeting? No, I uh, Robbie, I, I appreciate the difficulties. Uh, what we would say is in many ways we are trying to put pupils first because if we left a situation in which for a range of pupils they were not knowing what school they were going to be going to from a post-primary point of view, as, as the actual academic term had started, we don't believe that that would be putting pupils first. We went over this in considerable level of details and it is the nature of the, the system in terms of... Um, the application to schools in terms of the other preferences that are there, 
in terms of a range of things because you know if for example but i think to be fair this would be a fairly impossible situation if you had a situation in which the examinations could be done by aqe for instance in january and you could get a turnaround in the march in a week's time then i don't think that that then i think that would be something that would be quite doable what one of the things we're told by the examinating bodies themselves is you know they will require a period of time and cannot really shorten that to any great extent to the extent therefore that the results would not take place until until the middle of march now you know let me put it this way you could have a wee bit more leeway if, if it wasn't like christmas wasn't there you could maybe push things back a little bit a little bit further because of the way that the time of the year falls it just we've worked through all the systems with the ea there is little bits of flexibility that can be brought in which can shave a bit of time off but you're talking about roughly about a fortnight it just it simply would not be able to be achievable uh, within that and that is something which i think is accepted by aqe um and uh, as i said pptc were, weren't particularly an issue anyway because i think they had intended to schedule their examination site of it in december anyway so that, that that's within the the time range so look this is less than perfect nobody's acknowledging otherwise but it's just from a practical point of view all the detail was gone into at several meetings involving officials involving a meeting that i was involved in uh, myself there is a um, information produced of all the various actions that needs to be taken place it just it's just not physically possible for it to be able to be met certainly with any certainty in the, the time frame a lot of pupils would be able to be placed within the time frame but for a cohort of pupils they wouldn't be able to, to do that okay um so with regard to to the test and um it's been a long time since my kids did it my daughter was the, the first cohort to actually do ATE. um this is a paper-based test um in a classroom or big, big hall room and there's been a lot of um rightly so com commendation towards online learning at the moment but this isn't an online paper um i just want to, to have comfort to know that in, in the talks with when these papers are being put together that it's cognizant of the fact that the online learning at the moment cannot 100 percent collate everything that every child is getting and that every child has that um equal op equal learning opportunity at the moment um so i imagine this year's paper sorry the 20th paper is is going to be slightly different and tailored to just be cognizant of the the the, the gap in the proper classroom curriculum teaching okay we have no I, I i think robert you, you make a very valid point ultimately in terms of the setting of the test and i know that there is a sometimes particular sensitivities to the organizations in terms of the setting of the test they have the direct responsibility and also have control over it uh, you know i would be i think they've got to be cognizant and i think they will be cognizant of the fact that the pupils will not be in the same position in terms of their level of continuity of learning in terms of uh, you know how watertight for instance they're going to be in terms of the curriculum compared to that and i think that that will have to be to my mind that should clearly be reflected in the contents of the test i don't have control over that but i think that that will be something that will have to be um, reflected uh, within that okay i've just got two final questions sir one just to finish with the the aq and it is the it is the settings and i knew the chair asked you but your answer wasn't the same as what we got from aq and pptc they we had asked them and i had asked them uh, in terms of the potential for those exams to be held in primary school this year they said that that would be uh, a departmental issue or no, ea I, no sorry let, let, let me robbie okay sorry go ahead yeah, and so just just to clarify that, so that in terms of just pushing that argument further, so that we that I'm going to have a clearer picture of who we need to have in that conversation if it's a, something that can be achieved. So look, let, let let me make this absolutely clear: the responsibility and the opportunity for organisations, private organisations, which are setting, which is ultimately their own exam, in terms of the format, in terms of choosing the location, is entirely up to them. I. Uh, because I remember this very vividly, um, when I was last minister in the, I think probably about the autumn of 2016, a memo which is still stands and was made very clear um, was sent around schools. Because previously, you know, it, we're all aware that selection is a fairly controversial subject and there are different views. Previously, the position under previous ministers at that stage had been a a guidance or memo because i don't think it could be there's an argument how much it could ever be enforced from previous um education ministers saying schools were not to help in any way preparing up pupils for that 
and primary schools were not to be used as a venue for the tests. In the memo that was sent out in 2016, um, I lifted any restriction on schools doing preparation. I also indicated within that that it was a choice for, uh, that, that, if you like, any bar in terms of by saying you cannot be used as a venue was, was being lifted. There is no bar within the system um, on doing that. Now, schools themselves have a level of autonomy. You know, I don't think it's necessarily a case that you can force them to be a venue, but there's no bar in them being a venue. What I suspect, uh, I mean, look, and, people, and the likes of AQE can, can speak for themselves, uh, there may well be some level of reluctance uh, amongst the examining bodies to use primary schools because unless you're using every primary school, will that mean, for instance, that, that some pupils who are sitting, sitting a test in their home primary school might have, have some level of advantage on those who are travelling? You know, I, I could see an argument in relation to that. But from our point of view, there is no bar. And I think in the broader level on it, if we are looking at issues around social distancing and assuming that that still has to be in place come the November, December time, you know, I suspect that one of the byproducts of this will be having to having a greater spread of, of location, or possibly within locations having, you know, if if you're talking about a main hall, you may have to use a number of rooms within that school. So, you know, there will have to be a bit of a change, I think, on the location side of it. But there is absolutely, from a departmental point of view, no bar from us on any location being used for um, for the test for AQA. Brilliant. Minister, that, that, that's very good. That, that's cleared that up and it's certainly something okay. I would like us to take up as a committee individually with the, the, the body. So, and this is just the final question, okay? Thank you, and thank you for that. Um, with regard to end of year reports, um, and it was contacted me with regard to that, just looking at an update on that, and, and suppose, the, suppose one of the end of year conversations that would have happened previously with her, with their child, deciding whether to assist uh, this is that. that end of year chat with the um, P6 teacher, P7 teacher possibly. That probably will not have happened in some instances for whatever reason. But nevertheless, it, it does bring us back to the importance of the end of year reports and guidance for teachers. Could you, could you give us an update on Well, I, I think, look, I think there, there is. Look, if there's ways that we can scope out, and I know, um, I think earlier on, I'm trying to think it was either probably Karen or Catherine, I think, raised this about, you know, whether we need to have, sorry, end of year reports, sorry, you said? Yes, and the airport, yes. All oh, right, sorry, yeah, no, there is work. Uh, sorry, I thought, I was thinking about the, the end of year process for children there. Sorry, I said, no, end year reports, there is a legal requirement in terms of that. Uh, we're working with departmental solicitor's office so that a notice can be issued. I think what is likely to happen, Robbie, in relation to that um, will be, yes, there's still a requirement, but I think we are acutely aware that some of the conditions that are normally there for the end year report will be challenging to the point of being impossible. And so, therefore, I think there will be a, a much greater level of flexibility will be given to schools around that. So, for example, I think that um, within current regulations, there is a requirement that if a, if a parent asks for it, they're supposed to have like a potentially a one-to-one -one meeting with, um, you know, with the school, on particularly on the, on the NGO report. You know, we're looking at what flexibilities can be put within the system because certain things would simply be impractical. So I think that that we've been looking to much more light touch regime, but there's currently ongoing work with the Departmental Solicitor's Office to make sure that, that uh, a notice can be given to schools and in such a way that it, it is legally compatible with what is required, but also actually ensures that, that, that the burden is, is kept a minimum to, to schools. Yeah, thank you so much for your work on that, Peter. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Robbie, uh, before I bring Morris in, I just want to put on record, when we listen to the answers of some of these questions around locations for testing, social distancing that will have to be put in place. The, the extent to which some people are striving to maintain the testing of 10-year-olds during a global health pandemic is actually quite astonishing. Well, there will be many challenges. I, I suspect, Chair, that's probably more of a comment really than a question in, in, in relation to that. So I will take it, I will take it in that... Um, uh, in that vein, and on that regard. Okay. Let me the, bring, the point, the let point me, I'm making is. Bring, a, uh, Mar, let me bring Morris in then on that note. Fair okay. enough. Morris. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, thank you very much, Minister, for all your answers so far. I apologise. I didn't hear the first part of your uh, presentation, so if I repeat anything, please forgive me. But uh, I, I, can you hear me all right? Yeah, no, I hear you fine. I hear you fine, yes. I would welcome the, the commitment to provide more, uh, provide more and purchase more IT equipment, but there are pupils who do not have 
sole access to IT facilities at home. Yeah. Many tablets, computers, even internet access is shared or cost limited, which is specifically difficult for P7 pupils expected to prepare and sit an examination, which we were discussing earlier. Uh, it's an ex extremely unfair to base a child's future education on a test that they have not had the opportunity to properly prepare for, especially for those children from backgrounds where private tuition is not a viable option. So perhaps it's an unfair question for me to ask uh, you, Minister, but at this time, are there any plans in place to give precedence specific to P7 pupils to return to school as quickly as possible, should advice permit, to help towards their transfer examination? Well, in the broader level on it, um, and I think it's less to do with the test, but more to do with the fact that it's a key transition year. What I suppose we'd be looking at, and you'll see within the, um, the overall document, uh, you know, one issue which needs to be examined is whether we look at, and particularly given some of the gaps in terms of continuity of learning, whether we look in the run-up to September at uh, a potential for particular cohorts to be back a week or two early, and that is both in terms of the primary and post-primary side of it. Those who are involved in the transition year are in a critical bit. Those at the, the further end, from a post-primary point of view, who are particularly involved with, uh, say, the start of um, the sort of the major examinations I'm talking about in terms of the uh, at the up, the upper end, if you like, of the, so we'll need to look at what can be done there. There's no decisions that have been taken up, but that is certainly a considerable option that's on the table. You raise a point, I think, particularly as well, one of Morris, in terms of the, the issue of devices. Um, and I, I suppose while there will be some households in which there is not any IT equipment or a device, the bigger problem, undoubtedly, I think, that we're getting back is where there is a device within the house, but um, it is, there is, if you like, competition for it. I think that's where the, probably in terms of the numbers, will be the biggest, the biggest problem. That's why, as Derek indicated, and we'll get, there'll be more detail given next week, why there's effectively a, a, a three-stage process in, in relation to that. Uh, and I suppose particularly a lot of the focus on the final stage of that, uh, because from a procurement point of view, by the time this gets going, would be how we can provide that level of support, particularly to pupils um, in the, as we move into the next sort of academic year. Yeah, I appreciate that answer, uh, Minister. Just some of the schools that have been on to me are, are, are in areas of uh, deprivation. I think the phasing of devices where that can provide support for vulnerable children, where it can then be support for, for children who are facing particularly critical years from a, you know, from a broader point of view will be given levels of priority. But look, ultimately we want to be in the position where as much as possible there is that level of support for all pupils. Now, the other thing which will need to be taken into, into account in particular geographical locations, there will be some uh, pockets of Northern Ireland that no matter what kit would be provided, it would not be um, doable because of issues around broadband. And so therefore, th there'll need to be a mix of taking into account those situations as well. Yeah, okay. thanks very much for that, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Morris. Minister, just in closing, um, welcome publication of the NI Executive Coronavirus Recovery Plan yesterday. Um, and obviously, there's a, a key education strand as part of that pathway to recovery. The, uh, uh, the current position box of the education strand says that measures are in place to provide outreach services to special needs pupils. Can I ask what those measures are? Well, like it's indicated, we've got a multidisciplinary team working alongside um, health within those. Obviously, as part of both... Um, in terms of the message that we sent out to schools is to do a level of reach out where possible as well. Um, and obviously there are, as contained within the situation report will indicate, uh, there are um, work, there's work ongoing with health to be able to provide that, that level of reach out. It's a difficult situation. We are seeing, I suppose to be fair, a gradual movement in terms of some of the special schools in terms of opening. So there is that level of provision. Can I, it's not, can it's I not perfect but in that regard. Derek. Chair, can I come in there maybe brief Thank for you? you. Um, just, I mean, I think there, there are two broad approaches here. In terms of, I mean, it's an odd kind of phrase I'm using, the generality of children who might be deemed to be vulnerable 
Um, as you know, the Minister uh, a couple of weeks ago wrote out to schools to encourage them to reach out and encourage those young people to attend. More recently, the Education Authority has again written in more detail to schools, and they have put in place an arrangement to liaise with social services, with schools and the Education Authority at local level, so that social workers or parents or guardians who need a vulnerable person placed in a school and where they feel that person should be in school, there is an arrangement to place the person in the school. The Education Authority now has in place a very detailed weekly report that amounts to over 40 pages, specifying how all of its services that reach out to vulnerable young people. So I'm talking uh, child protection service, education welfare service, intercultural education service, counselling service, even the youth service. How those services are reaching out their caseloads, how they are fulfilling their statutory duties, as well as their other duties in this very difficult time. Now, the other broad strand of work we have talked about before, and Chair, you were good enough to give me a couple of contracts to follow up, which I have, and I got very compelling stories about the kinds of difficulties that families and young people are facing, maybe those people who normally attend special schools. The arrangement has been in place for tripartite liaison between Health and Social Care Trust, special school principals, and the education services to work through systematically the cases of the, the most needy families and the most needy pupils. And you know, a first pass at that has identified a cohort of about 175 young people whose cases need to be examined so that services can be put in place for those young people at this difficult time. It is, it is hard work, it is ongoing work, it will never be a tick box, yes, we've done that and we move on, we just keep at it, but I think we refine it week by week by week. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, genuinely, well, I, would... I think that's a, a significant step forward that that interdisciplinary team concept that you referred to, I think about three weeks ago, is being um, implemented at least for a small number of families of children with special educational needs and I, I look forward to getting further updates as to outcomes being achieved in terms of what is referred to in that executive plan of services um, being in place or actually in place. I, I don't think that plan reflects reality just yet even though it says that's the current position but I, I really look forward to getting substantive updates from you with regards to ser actual services being put in place as a result of those meetings, which, which are a step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, I have one final question on the pathway before I bring Justin in as well. Um, step five is unclear to me. It, it states um, expand early year school provision to full-time basis. Is that the first years of primary school? Okay, let, let, me, let me explain where we are with this. And yeah. You'll see as well as part of that, that is very, while there is an overarching issue, which is that, that all actions are dependent upon the broader, how it contributes to the, the broader sort of medical and following scientific advice. Uh, this is, I suppose, one option on the table that if, if we leave a, a scenario in which we have, for instance, at the start of the new school year, a phased approach where there is a fun form of rotation in whatever form that takes place of pupils and years to ensure that, that, that everybody has a mix of um, direct uh, in-school learning and remote learning. Um, a number of jurisdictions have, and in different ways, um, have come to a conclusion based on medical and scientific advice, that very young children may be, A, themselves a lot less at risk and may be less of a spreader. Now, there is conflicting opinion on that. This is, I suppose, that if we move to a scenario in which you have a part-time bit, because call it the unnamed stage six for everybody, is, is, if you like, society being back to normal, as we remember it, in which case schools being fully there on that basis. Uh, this is to hold out that there may be a possibility, depending upon 
where we are in a number of months' time if the evidence becomes very clear, and this is the medical guidance, that there may be some examination of younger children being there full-time at, at school. It is left as a possibility in the, on that basis on it, and if the medical evidence is not there, if the scientific evidence doesn't support it, then it will not happen. But it is, if you like, the one thing, I suppose, that is the potential um, interim step between being everybody being part-time and everybody being full-time. And it's noticeable that in a range of, a range of jurisdictions um, across Europe, that a differentiated approach according to younger children seems to be being, being taken. You don't necessarily have a situation where the same position is there for a six-year-old as a 16-year-old. Okay, so it's referring to primary school, the early years of primary school, rather than early years? Because, because this is potentially, and it may not go anywhere, because this is potentially a developing situation as regards where medicine and science sees this develop. What we know of things today is different from what we knew two months ago. It may well be different what we know three months, four months, five months down, down the road. So I suppose that thing, it is not tied down because in part, uh, it may well be that the medical advice in a number of months time may well say, well, actually, there's no particular problem with preschool. There's no particular problem with P1s, P2s, for instance. Okay. Or it may turn around and say, actually, the medical advice is that pretty much anybody at primary school may be. So, you okay. know, okay. It, but it's, it, not, it's, be it's, not, it's not a miraculous inclusion of an extension of early education and child care to full-time provision. <laughs> no, it's, no, no, it's, it, it's, no. Not, it's, not, okay. it's not intended, it, intended on, on, on that basis. And I suppose um, the, there isn't, given the fact that there isn't a direct reference to child care, because I think that, that, you know, it may have to be different solutions be found in reason. All the, all the references within that is to uh, essentially into the, the schooling situation, I suppose. Okay. Maybe also where you look at reception classes as well, as you know, something that's been considered in England um, okay. on that basis. So, you okay. know, th there are, th that's what the intent is. So okay. I, I don't want to put it in this That's a helpful clarification. It, it, it was what I had presumed. I, I suppose as well to say that's a, a fair number of stages that we have to progress through before we return to uh, anything that looks like what school was before coronavirus. And that, yeah, and that's, that's why, I mean, I, as I said, I presume effectively the step beyond across the board for that document is probably to be at a situation in which uh, effectively things are back to normal. Uh, that's why if we're looking at something of that nature, you're right in terms of the various steps. That, that's why it is, is graded on those, on those particular levels. And the same will apply to other sectors. Uh, I mean, I suppose the broader point to be made is and I suppose particularly because education is quite often driven by particular timings within school years. Uh, none of this is, is, is directly time linked in. It may also be across the board that different stages, and I think it's made clear in the document, that across the various sectors, different things may move at different speeds, and that will be driven by the medicine and by the science. Okay. Thank you. Um, Justin had indicated a very, very brief supplementary. Very quick one, Derek. Uh, sorry. Uh, Minister, listen, Minister and Derek and John, thank you for your time. Thank you for your forthrightness. And uh, you know, we all recognise we're we're in uncharted waters here, and it must feel like you're swimming against the tide all of the time. So we we'll appreciate your efforts and your forthrightness. Quick one in terms of substitute teachers again. Um, when was that bid made to the Department of Finance from the Department of Education for a package for support for substitute teachers? When, would you mean when was it made? That made on. Uh, I don't know the day. I mean, it, there was bids that were sought um, relatively early in the process. So you're talking quite a quite a time ago. We we, we, you know, we can get you just rather than rather than just pluck a date out of the top of my head. It was made. Okay. I suppose if you like, Strand, one of that was a, was a bid for an overall package. Yeah. The next the next the next step, whenever there was initial level of distributions, is one alternative route within this. Uh, and indeed, I think across the board, any packages that were being sought by all departments probably mainly came in at that, at that stage. They are theoretically at least still on the table on that basis. An alternative route was looked at that uh, given the, the tightness of funding that, that is there across the, the Northern Ireland Executive, whether a different route could then be looked with Treasury. That issue has been pursued. I think the point is that if then there's a, a final package that is being produced, um, that there will be a, a revised situation where there will be a um, certainly we would seek this as being 
a level of support from education and then a level of, of that then being uh, having a level of executive Executive support, okay. but we'll, we'll get you. I'm sure we can get you the date oh, at which sorry, the original bid was put in. Said early on in the process that you're talking uh, several weeks, seven, eight weeks since that bid was tabled to the, the finance yeah, minister. Yeah. Uh, there was an initial bid was put in, and we'll get you the. the it, it was a number of. It was a number of weeks ago. Okay. Initially, I think as well on the advice of EA, there was also some examination of a small amount for other casual subsidies outside the teacher side of it. I think EA, to be fair, moved away from that that situation in part because maybe the case wasn't as strong, it was a lot more complex to try and, to try and deal with in that regard. So uh, there is, there's been a bespoke element of this that has always been in terms of subject teachers. We will get, we'll, we will get the committee the details of uh, when that was specifically put in. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Derek. Okay. We're, I think we're about to be removed from the room here. Apologies. So, um, Minister uh, and Derek, sincere thanks for your updates today, and we, we look forward to ongoing engagement with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we've managed to cover a, a significant amount of material today. Can I bring the clerk in to summarise on our two evidence sessions? So, members, if you can hear me, uh, in terms of the evidence session we've just had, I think maybe we're writing to the department um, in line with uh, Ms Kelly's question about uh, the department's plans around holiday hunger. I think are we also asking for the department to undertake an, or EEA to undertake an audit of ICT in schools? I know they've done something on this. They did a survey previously. But that's not an audit. Um, so additionally, we're also asking about the timing of the bid for substitute teacher and again teachers, and again seeking a further update, a further update on the outcomes for um, vulnerable children. I think we still have um, correspondence in the post about that, but I think that was the DE um, and minister. Um, Briefing. I don't think there was anything else for that. Members are content. Content. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms, okay. in terms of then the uh, AQ and PPTC, we're writing to them. Um, Morris had sent through a question there, um, and uh, hopefully he will forgive me if I, I think it's it's more like a comment. Um, just is it the case that the committee feels as a committee that they're very concerned about the present situation? They think that the, you know, the, the, the lockdown of schools was inevitable, but it's going to lead to an unfair situation, um, and that they are concerned on the impact this is going to have on parents, children, and schools, worried about the possible deluge of challenges and um, special circumstances, etc. And they're indicating that they expect AQE and PPTC to work imaginatively with the department and the education authority in order to provide uh, an original resolution to what is uh, an original set of problems. Would that be a fair summary of where the committee is? I, I think so, Not notwithstanding particular positions in relation to the tests themselves. I think Robbie had detailed key issues in terms of why more of a delay had not been a possible between the two depart uh, bodies that, that uh, was answered fairly significantly. Um, location, I think we got the answers in the end there, and um, the support for key workers, I suppose, but that, that can extend to anyone who is in work and unable to um, you know, f uh, fulfill remote learning. So I, I think we're covering most of that. I'll, if I don't stop talking, I'll stray into my feelings on this matter. So, are members content with the clerk's summary on that? The minister did point out that it is up to the provider now to do that. So, I actually think that that's something we should be writing to them about specifically um, and about seeking ur sort of an urgent clarification. Because I think, in terms of if we can improve what is not a, a uh, we, don't, we don't agree in the process, but well, if we can agree that we can improve it as far as we can this year, I think one of the steps that can be taken is to minimise the disruption to the pupils by trying to have the test hosted in their own schools, in their own familiar surroundings, if that's possible, um, and it, you know, with their own uh, friends and stuff. So I'm not taking the view of the committee, obviously, but certainly it's a question I'd like to ask if that's something that the committee were content with. Haven't, give, haven't had clarification from the minister that this is within the gifting of the sector? I think the answer to the question is yes. Um, interestingly, the minister cited a desire to uphold um, 
equal opportunity um, in relation to this test by saying that if you set it in in host primary schools, that um, some pupils that might not be able to set it in their own host primary school for for whatever reason, I don't I don't know whether there's too few pupils or whatever, um, then you might create a disadvantage. Uh, look, I think I think we're content to write to AQE and PPTC to say how is uh, the location, the setting of the tests being explored with regards to minimising impact on pupils and ensuring health and safety in terms of social distancing. Does that does, is, is that adequate, Robbie? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because clustering obviously is a big a big concern. Um, you know, with, with COVID and, and everybody's cognizant of the fact that there's going to be a graduated return to school, there's going to be complexity and they're not going to have vast numbers of pupils in, in any room. So, yeah, I think that makes sense. Chair, thank you. OK, can I add to that, Clark? Can we, can we, I think we should consider inviting the Governing Bodies Association to attend the committee. But in, in, in addition to that, perhaps we could um, offer them uh, to attend. But can we ask them urgently what, what contingency planning is taking place with regards to the disruption being caused to the the normal approach to uh, transfer tests 2020. So, are we really asking them what their contingency plans are in respect of admissions? Because that's yes, yeah, yeah. But yes, yeah. Sorry, Chair, Pratt, is, that, is that okay? Is that agreed? Members agreed. They're agreed. Okay, thanks. And finally, Chairperson, um, does the committee want to write to the department, maybe suggesting? that it issues guidance to schools on contingency planning for um, uh, post-primary enrolment and also guidance on how to deal with special circumstances. I know that the witnesses said that the schools are well versed in it, but given we are in a new set of situations, um, and it is a matter for schools who they uh, admit, but they might value guidance. That's agreed? Agreed, members, yeah. Okay, thanks, Clark. Finally, sorry, members, but um, just in tabled items, uh, there are two things. Uh, Firstly, at page 93 is a response on parent-teacher conferences and school reports. Um, the Minister did talk about this, but there is actually an answer. Um, secondly, at page 97 is a copy of the SIA consultation. Look, I'm just, we're very little time, so I'm just going to gallop through this really quickly. Um, this is a very short consultation. It's only about two weeks. The key elements are, so nothing's decided yet, they're consulting on how the appeals process would work. And it kind of looks as if, for what they're consulting on, is that um, centres, i.e. schools, would probably only be able to appeal if they thought that SIA has applied its process incorrectly, not that the process is of itself flawed, nor if they think the results are very different from what they expected. Um, secondly, the students, it would appear, may be unable to appeal themselves. So it's unlike your GCSEs and A-levels where you can send back your GCSE to be remarked or what have you. Um, and students would probably not be able to appeal based on teachers' professional judgment being flawed, nor on their rank order being incorrect, nor on their own exam centres' processes being incorrect or incorrectly applied. So there would be a very narrow set of circumstances. It seems it would be just the centres, if I've understood it correctly. Uh, it also isn't clear, uh, to my reading of it anyway, whether an appeal by a centre would lead to all students at that centre having their grade changed for better or for worse. So that if they decided uh, something was wrong, um, whether everybody would move up or everybody would move down. So again, that's rather different from the current process we have. So if you send back your A level, so your A level grade that's changed, it's not everybody in the school usually. Um, so uh, that might be quite an unusual situation. And also, persons involved in the calculation of grades may also be involved in the appeals process. So usually those would be quite separate. But because this is a unique and complex process, that is probably not going to be possible this year. So. That's really just for members to note, if members are. Sure, no. that's you're saying if I, I get my A-levels results and I think that's crazy, unfair, and, and I merited a much higher grade, I can't question it. I think you'd have to go back to your school and the school would have to agree to uh, challenge the result and it would have to be based on, um, as I said, something being done incorrectly um, rather than in the process itself. Um, but say a school got a set of results and I thought, oh, I thought all those people who are going to do much better than they did than they actually did, they can't appeal on that basis. They would have to appeal on the basis of something being incorrect rather than, you know, not getting the results that we thought, um, which would be different from what would normally happen. I mean, I know anecdotally from schools that they would send back, like, 
the whole history class did not as well as they expected, so they sent all the A-level results back again just to see what would happen or encouraged um, uh, pupils to do that. So, Can let's, I go, think, let's go on quick now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so does it sound like the, you'd want a briefing from CL on the yeah on this? Right, okay then. Do, Clark, just the, in terms of timing, normally committees would take a briefing on the consultation when the consultation has closed so that we have access to some sort of analysis of the consultation responses in order to inform our question and our responses at that briefing. Is that, is that the best approach, do you think, on this? I think it is. It's also it's a very short consultation when does it period. Close? I think it's only two weeks. Okay. Uh, Are members so content uh, that we take a briefing from SEA further to the close of the consultation and with access to an analysis of consultation responses? Great. Agreed. Lovely. Thanks, members. Agreed. Okay. So, correspondence. If okay. Want. Members' correspondence. Clark, do you want to speak to that? Members, just I'm hoping that members are content to um, uh, note the index of correspondence, which is at page 128. Again, we're going to defer the Northern Ireland Forest School Association because if members are content because they've sent us more. Um, there's also uh, another piece of correspondence, page 179, marked it as restricted because it's from concerned parents giving personal details about their child. So we'll ask members to uh, not name the parents or the child. Um, but what they're concerned about is that the child has missed a lot of preschool owing to the lockdown, the child has particular needs, be required to progress to primary school, um, and that they're calling for a change to legislation around school starting age. And the Minister had previously indicated they wouldn't be doing that in this mandate. Now, while the committee doesn't deal with individual cases, of course, um, it's just it's something for members to consider about how COVID-19 might actually impact on preschool because kids haven't been able to go to preschool and yet they will then be progressing on to primary so they won't have that, that foundation as it were uh, prior to them moving on so I think maybe Mr Butler might want to comment Chair. Robbie do you want to comment? Yeah absolutely thank you so much Peter thank you and um, without prejudice I've, I've been involved when I know a number of other members have with groups like Tiny Life for some time in particular with um, children that are born prematurely and extremely prematurely and the, those um, are, are those people face, are, are faced with difficulties throughout their formative years and certainly there's, there's, there's no argument against the fact that COVID uh, um, problems and the problem with uh, getting preschool places has impacted them unfairly even, even more and a lot of the concerns that are being raised by parents of, of these kids are, are real and valid and I think it's certainly something we would as a committee like to maybe discuss wider with regard to if there is any scope through these special circumstances to seek um, a differentiation on the, uh, on, on the school age entry, um, but what, what steps can be made to improve the opportunities for, for this, this sort of community of people? Yeah, sure, can I, yes, can I join with uh, Robbie there? I have a case, um, child's actually in P6 now, uh, and really should have been, uh, would have had advantage in being held back uh, if that had been possible, instead of going into uh, when they joined the primary school. Uh, and indeed, similar situation to this uh, lady had, uh, had not been able to enrol the child in, in uh, preschool. Uh, so I would be supportive of, of, of at least investigating to see whether or not there is uh, some action rather than if we can stay away from the additional legislation, but some other action that, that may be possible, Chair. Yeah, I've, I've, it has been raised with me previously. I was scheduled to meet the Minister about deferral of school starting age um, and was unable to due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Clark, am I right in saying the Minister may have corresponded with us in relation to this previously? He did, yes, and came back on that, that meeting, or the, yeah. which never actually I, happened. So. I don't think there is an intention to, ch to change legislation to allow the option of deferral of school starting age for particular circumstances, the like of which Robbie has outlined, but um, it seems to me like there is a, a mounting issue here that we might want to go back to the Minister about in the terms that Robin has suggested, whereas... We appreciate his previous indication that he is not minded to change the legislation, but is there any flexibility in the current exceptional circumstances? Is that agreed? 
Okay. Chair, can I sign off now? I've got to go and sign on now for communities. No problem. No. Chair, just, okay. just briefly, Thank you. Chair, in relation to the discussion that you're just having, there, there is flexibility in relation to this, but once they start school, so for instance, they can spend two years in primary one or so on and so forth, and I think it's within the school's discretion. There's no statement and process required. Okay. I, I am I'm actually uh, beginning to receive correspondence asking about s repeating school years. At, across the school year thresholds um, due to COVID-19, um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what way that has progressed, but uh, it, it is a question the parents are starting to ask. In addition to I know a long-standing question about the deferral of school starting age, people are asking about repeating school years. Anyway, I need to, we're literally about to be removed from the room. Clark, right. correspondence. Right. Communities, yeah. so we can tend to write the department in those terms. Agreed. Great. Very good. Uh, that's basically that. If members are content with correspondence, just um, one, one check on correspondence. We, we agreed. Do we agree to write to the minister for finance for an update on the bid for a substitute teachers package? We asked. Um, the minister said he would come back to us. But could we write to, as the committee, could we write to the, to the minister for finance for an update on that bid? That agreed. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Content. Yep. Yep. Okay. Is that correspondence? Yes, Clark? it is. Okay, then uh, for work program members is at page 196. Can I advise members that I have had a demonstration of the new Starleaf meeting system? It's a, a video conferencing system which will allow committee meetings to be broadcast while being undertaken remotely by video. Unlike uh, Microsoft Teams, it appears that the department will also be able to use this system. However, officials will probably only be able to dial in rather than appear on video stream. Um, can I ask members if, based on this, they wish to um, cancel scheduled informal COVID-19 teleconference meetings and make these formal COVID-19 Starleaf, Starleaf meetings going forward, uh, subject, of course, to the availability of Starleaf? Clark, do you want to speak to that? Chair, do you want to? Maybe we'll defer discussion about this because hopefully I just got an email saying we may have Starleaf um, next week, so then you can try it, taste and see, and if you like it, um, they can then dispense with the uh, <laughs> informal meetings. And as we're about to be kicked out by communities, can Okay, we? happy to <laughs> close. Yes. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to be a constructive system. Um, we'll be able to see all your lovely faces again. Um, okay, members, content. Uh, any other business? Okay, next uh, committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday the 20th of May, room 29, uh, possibly via Starleaf at 9.15. Thank you, members. Thanks, members. Thank you. Committee meeting does now adjourn. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.